Chapter 49. Tessa. Our last night with Hardin's mom consists mostly of drinking tea and her telling embarrassing stories of when Hardin was little. That and about 10 reminders that next year Christmas is in England, no excuses. The thought of celebrating Christmas with Hardin a year from now makes my stomach flutter. For the first time since we met, I can see a future with him. Not necessarily having children and getting married, but for once I feel secure enough about his feelings to be able to look a year ahead. The next morning, when Hardin returns from dropping Trish off at the airport at far too early an hour, I wake up. I hear him drop his clothes onto the floor, and he climbs back into bed wearing only boxers. He wraps his arms around me once more. I'm still a little irritated with him from our earlier conversation, but his arms are cold, and I missed him during his absence from our bed. I go back to work tomorrow, I say after a few minutes, unsure if he's already fallen asleep or not. I know, he replies. I'm excited to get back to Vance. Why? Because I love it there, and I've had the week off. I miss working. You're quite the overachiever, he mocks, and I know he's rolling his eyes, even though I can't see his face. Reflexively, this makes me roll my own eyes. Sorry that I love my internship and you don't like your job. I do like my job, and I had the same job you have. I just left it for something better, he brags. Do you only like it more, because you get to do it from home? Yeah, that's the main reason. What's the other reason? I felt like people thought I only got the job because of Vance. This is not a huge revelation, but it's a much more honest answer than I expected from him. I expected a word or two about how the job sucked or was annoying. Do really you think people thought that? I roll onto my back, and Hardin leans up on his elbow, to look down at me. I don't know. No one said it, but I felt like they were thinking it. Especially after he hired me as an actual employee, not just an intern. Do you think he was upset, when you left to work for someone else? He smiles a smile, that appears especially bright in the half-lit bedroom. No, I don't think so. His employees were constantly complaining about my supposed attitude anyway. Supposed attitude? I tease. He cups my cheek and dips his head down to kiss my forehead. Yes, supposed. I am very charming. No attitude at all. He smiles against my skin. I giggle, and he smiles even more, pressing his forehead against mine. What do you want to do today, he asks. I don't know. I was thinking of calling Landon and going to the store. He draws back a little. For what? To talk to him, and see when he can meet up with me. I'd like to give him those tickets. The gifts are at their house. I'm sure they already opened them. I don't see them opening them without us being there. I do. My point exactly, I tease. But Hardin's already turned serious with the mention of his family. Do you think what do you think about me apologizing well? Not apologizing but what, if I called him, you know, my dad. I know that I need to tread lightly, when it comes to Hardin and Ken. I think you should call him. I think you should try to make sure, what happened yesterday doesn't ruin the beginning of the relationship you were forming with him. I guess he sighs. After I hit him, I thought for a second, that you were going to stay there, and make me leave. You did? Yeah, I did. I'm glad you didn't, but that's what I thought. I lift my head off the mattress, and plant a small kiss on his jawline instead of answering. I have to admit, that I probably would have done, just that had he not already come clean about his past. That changed everything for me. It changed the way I look at Hardin, not in a negative way, or a positive one, just a more understanding way. Hardin looks past me toward the window. I can call him. Today, I guess. Do you think, that we could go to their house? I really want to give them their gifts. Linking back to me, he says, we could just tell them to open them, while you're on the phone. That's basically the same, only you won't have to see their fake smiles at your terrible presence. Harden. I whine. He chuckles and lays his head on my chest. I'm teasing. You give the best gifts. That keychain with the wrong sports team was killer. He laughs. Go back to bed. I swat at his messy hair. What did you need from the store, he asks as he lies back down. I forgot that I had mentioned that. Nothing. No, no, 
You said you needed to go to the store. What was it? Plugs or something? Plugs? You know to plug yourself. What? I don't get a tampons. I blush. My whole body blushes, I'm sure. Oh no. Do you even have a period? Oh my god, Harden, stop talking about it. What? You're embarrassed to talk about your menstruation with me? When he lifts up his face to look at me, a huge grin is plastered across it. I'm not embarrassed. It's just inappropriate, I defend, highly embarrassed. He smiles. We've done quite a few inappropriate things, Teresa. Don't call me Teresa, and stop talking about it. I groan and cover my face with my hands. Are you bleeding now? I feel his hand travel down my stomach. No I lie. I have gotten away from exactly this situation before, because we're always so on and off, and it just never happened. Now that we're going to be around each other more steadily, I knew this would happen, I just was avoiding it. So you wouldn't mind, if I his hand slips into the top of my panties. Harden. I squeal and smack his hand away. He chuckles. Admit it, then. Say, Harden, I'm on my period. No, I am not saying that. I know my face is a deep red by now. Come on, it's just a little blood. You're disgusting. Bloody amazing. He smiles, obviously proud of his ridiculous joke. You're obnoxious. You need to lighten up learn to go with the flow. He laughs harder. Oh my god. Okay, if I say it, will you stop with the menstrual jokes? I'm not making jokes. Period. His laugh is contagious, and it feels great to be lying in bed laughing with Hardin, despite the subject of conversation. Hardin, I'm on my period. I just started right before you got home. There, are you happy? Why are you embarrassed by it? I'm not. I just don't think it's something that women should discuss. It's not a big deal, I don't mind a little blood. He presses himself against me. I scrunch my nose. You're gross. I've been called worse. He smiles. You're in a good mood today, I point out. Maybe you would be too, if it wasn't that time of month. I groan and grab the pillow from behind me to cover my face. Can we please talk about something else? I say through the pillow. Sure sure someone's bloody panties are in a twist. He laughs. I pull the pillow from my face and hit him in the head with it before climbing off the bed. I hear him laughing as he opens the dresser to find a pair of pants, I assume. It's early, only 7 in the morning, but I'm wide awake. I start a pot of coffee and make myself a bowl of cereal. I can't believe Christmas is over. In a few days the year will be over. What do you usually do to celebrate the new year? I ask Hardin when he sits down at the table in white cotton drawstring pants. Go out, usually. Go where? Parties, or a club. Or both. Last year was both. Oh. I hand him the bowl of cereal. What would you like to do? I'm not sure. I want to go out, I think, I answer. He raises one eyebrow. Do you do? Yeah, don't you? I don't really give a shit what we do, but if you want to go out, that is what we shall do. He brings a spoonful of frosted flakes to his mouth. Okay I say, unsure of where we'll go. I make myself another bowl. Are you going to ask your father if we can stop by today? I ask him and take seat next to him. I don't know maybe they could come here? I suggest. Hardin's eyes narrow. I don't think so. Why not? You'd be more comfortable here, right? He closes his eyes for a moment, before opening them again. I guess. Let me call them in a bit. I finish my breakfast quickly, and stand up from the table. Where are you going, he asks. To clean, obviously. Clean what? The place is spotless. No, it's not, and I want it to be perfect, if we're having guests over. I rinse my bowl, and place it in the dishwasher. You could help clean, you know? Since you're the one who makes most of the mess, I point out. Oh no. You're much better at cleaning than I am. He gestures at the cereal box. I roll my eyes, but give it to him. I don't mind cleaning, because, honestly, I like things a certain way, and Hardin's version of cleaning isn't actually cleaning. He just shoves things wherever they'll fit. Oh, and don't forget that we need to go to the store to get your plugs. He laughs. 
Stop calling them that. I throw a dish towel at his face, and he laughs harder at my embarrassment. Chapter 50 Tessa After the apartment is clean to my standards, I go to the store to get tampons and a few things in case Ken, Karen, and Landon come over. Hardin tried to accompany me, but I knew he'd be teasing me about the tampons the entire time, so I made him stay home. When I return, he's sitting in the same spot on the couch. Have you called your father yet? I ask from the kitchen. No I was waiting for you, he replies, then wanders into the kitchen and sits down at the table with a sigh. I'll call now. I nod and sit across from him while he presses his phone to his ear. Uh hey. Hardin says into the receiver. Then he sets the phone to speaker and places it on the table between us. Hardin? Ken's voice is surprised. Yeah um, look, I was wondering if you wanted to come over or something. Come over? Hardin looks up at me and I can tell that his patience is already wearing thin. My hand moves across the table to rest atop his and I nod in encouragement. Yeah you, Karen, and Landon. We can exchange gifts, since we didn't yesterday. Mum's gone, he says. You're sure that's okay? Ken asks his son. I just asked, didn't I? Hardin says, and I squeeze his hand. I mean yeah, that's fine, he corrects, and I smile at him. Okay, well, let me talk to Karen, but I know she'll be thrilled. What time will be good for you? Hardin looks at me. I'm out too, and he tells his father. Okay well, we'll see you at 2. Tessa will text Landon the address, Hardin says and hangs up the phone. That wasn't so bad, right? I ask. He rolls his eyes. Sure. What should I wear? He gestures to my jeans and WCU t-shirt. That. Definitely not. This is our Christmas. No, it's the day after Christmas, so you should wear jeans. He smiles, and his fingers tug at his lip ring. I'm not wearing jeans. I laugh and head to the bedroom to decide what to wear. I'm holding my white dress to my chest in front of the mirror when Hardin walks into the bedroom. I don't know if wearing white is the best idea. He smiles. For God's sake, stop it. I say. You're cute when you're embarrassed. I grab my maroon dress from the closet. This dress holds a lot of memories for me. I wore it to my first frat party with Steph. I miss Steph despite all the anger I feel felt toward her. I feel betrayed by her, but at the same time in a lot of ways she was right when she said it wasn't fair for me to forgive Hardin but not her. What's going on in that mind of yours? Hardin questions. Nothing I was just thinking of Steph. What about her? I don't know I miss her, sort of. Do you miss your friends? I ask. He hasn't mentioned any of them since the letter. No. He shrugs. I would rather spend my time with you. I'm enjoying this honest Hardin, but I note, you could still spend time with them too. I guess. I don't know. I don't really care either way. Do you even want to be around them you know, after everything? His eyes focus on the floor. I don't know, but I'd be willing to try, at least, and see how it goes. Not Molly, though. I scowl. He looks up mischievously. But the two of you are such great friends. Ugh, enough about her. What do you think they'll do on New Year's Eve? I ask. I don't know how it will be to be around everyone, but I miss having friends, or what passed for friends. There'll probably be a party. Logan is obsessed with New Year's are you sure you want to go out with him? I smile. Yet if it blows up in my face, then we'll stay in next year. Hardin's eyes widen when I mention next year but I pretend I don't notice. I need our Christmas do-over to be peaceful today. I'm focusing on today. I need to make something for everyone to eat. I should have said three, it's already noon, and I'm not even ready. I rub my hands over my makeup-free face. Go ahead and get ready, I'll make something Hardin says, then smirks. Just make sure you eat only what I put on your plate. Joking about poisoning your father, lovely, I tease. He shrugs and wanders off. I wash my face and apply light makeup before pulling my hair out of its ponytail and curling the ends. By the time I finish getting ready and get myself dressed, a wonderful garlic smell is coming from the kitchen. When I join Hardin in the kitchen, 
I see he's laid out a couple of trays of fruit and vegetables and already set the table. I'm really impressed by what he's done, though I do have to fight the urge to rearrange a few things. I'm so glad that Hardin was willing to invite his father over to our apartment, and even more relieved that he seems to be in a really good mood today. Checking the clock, I see our company will be here in 30 minutes, so I begin cleaning up the small mess Hardin made while cooking and get the apartment spotless again. I wrap my arms around his waist as he stands in front of the oven. Thank you for doing all of this. He shrugs. It's nothing. Are you okay? I ask and then wrap my arms and turn him to face me. Yeah, I'm fine. Are you sure you aren't a little nervous? I ask. I can tell he is. No well, just a little. It's just weird as fuck to have him coming here, you know? I know. I'm really proud of you for inviting him. I press my cheek against his chest, and his hands move to my waist. You are? Of course I am, bah, Hardin. What was that what were you going to say? I hide my face. Nothing. I don't know where the sudden urge to call him pet names comes from, but it's embarrassing. Tell me, he coos and lifts my chin, to force me out of hiding. I don't know why, but I almost called you babe again. I bring my bottom lip between my teeth, and his smile grows. Go ahead, call me it, he says. You'll make fun of me. I smile weakly. No, I won't. I call you baby all the time. Yeah, but it's different when you do it. How so? I don't know it's, like, sexier or something when you do more romantic. I don't know. I flush. You're awfully shy today. He smiles and plants a kiss on my forehead. I like it, though. So go ahead and call me it. I hug him tighter. Okay. Okay what? Okay babe. The word tastes strange rolling off of my tongue. Again. I let out a surprised squeak as he lifts me onto the cold countertop and stands between my legs. Okay, babe. I repeat. His cheeks are a deeper shade of pink than usual. I really love that. It's what did you say? Sexy and romantic? He smiles. A sudden bravery makes me speak again. Is it, babe? I smile and bite my lip again. Yes, incredibly sexy. He presses his lips against my neck, and I shiver as his hands trail up my thighs. Don't think these will keep me out. His fingers draw circles on my black tights. They may not, but the you know will. A knock at the door makes me jump, and Hardin smiles and winks at me. As he walks to the door, he says over his shoulder, Oh, baby that won't either. Chapter 51. Hardin. When I open the door, my attention is immediately drawn to my dad's face. A deep purple bruise is clear on his cheek, and his bottom lip holds a small cut right down the center. I nod as my greeting to them, not knowing what the hell to say. Your place is so lovely. Karen smiles, and the three of them stand by the door, unsure what to do. Tessa saves all of us by walking into the room. Come on in. You can put those by the tree, she says to Landon, gesturing to the bag of gifts in his arms. We brought the gifts you left at the house as well, my dad says. The air is thick with tension, not an angry tension, exactly, but really damn awkward tension. Tess smiles sweetly. Thank you so much. She's so good at making people feel welcome. At least one of us is. Landon walks to the kitchen first, followed by Karen and Ken. I reach for Tess's hand, using her as an anchor for my anxiety. How was the drive? Tessa tries to start conversation. It wasn't too bad. I drove, Landon answers. The conversation flows from uncomfortable at first to somewhat relaxed as we eat. In between courses, Tessa squeezes my hand under the table. The food was excellent, Karen compliments, looking at Tessa. Oh, I didn't make it, Hardin did, Tessa tells her, and places her hand on my thigh. Really? It was delicious, Hardin. Karen smiles. I'd have been okay with Tessa taking the credit for the meal. Having four sets of eyes on me is making me want to vomit. Tessa applies more pressure to my leg, wanting me to say something. I look at Karen. Thanks, I say, and Tessa squeezes again, prompting me to offer Karen a really fucking awkward smile. After a few seconds of silence, 
Tessa stands up and grabs her plate from the table. She walks into the kitchen, and I debate whether or not to follow. The food was really good, son. I'm impressed, my dad says, breaking the silence. Yeah, it's just food, I mumble. His eyes shift down, and I correct myself. I mean, Tess is the better cook, but thanks. He seems pleased with my answer, and takes a drink from his glass. Karen smiles awkwardly, staring at me with those weirdly almost comforting eyes of hers. I look away. Tessa joins us, before anyone else has the chance to compliment the food. Well, should we open the gifts? Landon asks. Yes, Karen and Tessa answer at the same time. I stay as close to Tessa as possible as we go into the living room. My dad, Karen, and Landon sit on the couch. I reach for Tessa's hand and gently pull her to sit on my lap in the chair. I see her look toward our guests, and Karen tries to hide a smile. Tessa looks away, embarrassed, but doesn't move from my lap. I lean up a little more and wrap my arm tighter around her waist. Landon stands and grabs the gifts. He passes them around, and I focus on Tessa and the way she gets excited over things like this. I love the way she's always so enthusiastic about everything, and I love the way she makes people comfortable. Even on Do Over Christmas. Landon hands her a small box marked from Ken and Karen. When she tears the wrapping paper off, a blue box with Tiffany and company written in silver scroll on the front is revealed. What is it? I ask quietly. I don't know shit about jewelry, but I know that brand is expensive. A bracelet. She extracts and dangles a silver chain link bracelet in front of me. A small bow-shaped charm and a heart hang from the expensive metal. The shiny object makes the bracelet on her wrist, my gift to her, look like complete shit. Of course it is, I say under my breath. Tessa frowns at me, then turns back to them. It's beautiful. Thank you both so much. She beams. She already I begin to complain. I hate that they got her a better gift than mine. I get it, he has money. Couldn't they have gotten her something else, anything else? But Tessa turns back to me silently begging me not to make shit any more awkward. I sign to feed and lean back against the chair. What's in yours? Tessa smiles, trying to lighten my mood. She rests against me, kissing my forehead. She looks down at the box on the arm of the chair, hinting for me to open it. When I do, I hold the expensive contents up for her to see. A watch. I show her, trying to humor her the best I can. Honestly, I'm still fucking irritated about the bracelet. I wanted her to wear my bracelet every day, I wanted it to be her favorite gift. Chapter 52. Harden. Karen beams over the box of pens from Tessa. I've been wanting this at all season. Tessa thought I didn't notice that she added my name to the small snowman-shaped tags, but I did. I just didn't feel like crossing it out. I feel like a jerk because I only got you a gift card. When you got me these awesome tickets, Landon says to Tessa. I have to admit that I'm happy for his impersonal present of a gift card for the year eater that I got her for her birthday. If he had gotten something more thoughtful, it would have annoyed me, but with Tessa's caring smile, you'd think he bought her a fucking first edition Austin novel. I still can't believe they got her an expensive bracelet. What show-offs? What if he wants to wear this new one instead of mine? Thank you for the gifts. They're great, my dad says, and looks at me, holding up the keychain Tessa mistakenly chose for him. I feel a little guilty for his busted face, but at the same time I find the weird coloring slightly amusing. I want to apologize for my outburst, well, I wouldn't say I want to, but I need to. I don't want to go backward with him. It was sort of okay to spend time with him, I guess. Karen and Tessa get on pretty well and I feel obligated to give her the chance to have a motherly figure around, since it's my fault her and her mother are on such bad terms. It's good for me, in a fucked up way, that they are, because it's one less person in the way of us being together. Harden? Tessa's voice says into my ear. I look up at her and realize that one of them must have been talking to me. Would you want to go with Landon to the game? She asks. What? No, I say quickly. Thanks. Man. Landon rolls his eyes. I mean, I don't think Landon would want that, I correct myself. 
Being decent is much harder than I thought it would be. I'm only doing this for her well, if I'm honest, it's a little for myself, as my mum's words, that my anger will only give me busted hands, and a lonely life keep repeating in my head. Tessa and I can go if you won't, Landon says to me. Why is he trying to annoy me, when I'm trying to be nice for once? She smiles. Yeah, I'll go with. I don't know anything about hockey, but I'll tag along. Without thinking, I wrap my other arm around her waist and pull her against my chest. I'll go. I give in. Amusement is clear on Landon's face, and I can tell even with Tessa's back to me that she wears the same expression. I really like what you guys have done to the place, Hardin, my father says. It came decorated mostly, but thanks, I reply. I have come to the conclusion that it's less awkward when I'm punching him than when we're trying to avoid an argument. Karen smiles at me. It was really nice of you to invite us over. My life would be easier if she was a hideous bitch, but of course she's one of the nicest people I have ever met. It's nothing, really after what happened yesterday, it's the least I can do. I know my voice sounds shakier and more strained than I wanted to. It's okay things happen, Karen assures me. Not really. I don't think that violence is a regular holiday tradition, I say. Maybe it will be from now on, Tessa can punch me out next year, Landon jokes in a lame attempt to lighten the mood. Maybe I will. Tessa sticks her tongue out at him, and I smile slightly. It won't happen again, I say and look at my dad. My dad looks at me thoughtfully. It was partly my fault, son. I should have known it wasn't going to go well, but I hope now that you let some of the anger out, we can get back to trying to develop a relationship, he says to me. Tessa puts her small hands over mine to comfort me, and I nod. Ah, uh, yeah cool, I say timidly. Yeah I chew on the inside of my cheek. Landon slaps his hands on his knees and stands. Well, we should get going, but let me know, if you really want to go to the game. Thank you both for having us over today. Tessa hugs the three of them as I lean against the wall. I was nice enough today, but there's no way that I'm hugging anyone. Except Tessa, of course, but after my politeness today she should be giving me more than a hug. I stare at the way her loose dress hides her beautiful curves and literally have to talk myself down before I drag her to the bedroom. I remember the first time I saw her in that hideous dress. Well, back then it was hideous to me, now I sort of adore it. She came out of the dorm looking like she was getting ready to sell Bibles door to door. She rolled her eyes at me when I teased her as she climbed into my car, but I had no idea that she would make me fall in love with her. I wave once more as our company leaves and let out a deep breath that I hadn't realized I was holding. The hockey game with Landon, what the fuck have I gotten myself into? That was so nice. You were so nice. Tessa praises me and immediately kicks off her high heels before lining them neatly by the door. I shrug. It was okay, I guess. It was better than okay. Tessa beams at me. Whatever, I stayed with an exaggerated grumpiness and she giggles. I really love you. You know that, don't you? She asks as she walks around the living room picking up after everyone. I tease her about her cleaning habits, but the place would be trashed if it were only me living here. So, the watch? Do you like it? She asks. No, it's hideous, and I don't wear watches. I think it looks nice. What about your bracelet? I hesitantly ask her. It's beautiful. Oh, I look away. It's fancy and expensive, I add. Yeah, I feel bad that they spent all that money on it when I won't really be wearing it. I'll have to wear it when they're around once or twice. Why won't you wear it? Because I already have a favorite bracelet. She shakes her wrist back and forth, making the charms hit one another. Oh. Do you like mine better? I can't hide my stupid smile. She looks at me with a lightly chastising look. Of course I do, Harden. I try to hold on to some of the little dignity I have left, but I can't help but scoop her up by the back of her legs. When she screams, I laugh loudly. I don't remember ever laughing this way in my entire life. Chapter 53. Tessa. The next morning I wake up early, shower, and with my towel still wrapped around me, quickly start a pot of that elixir of life, coffee. As I watch it brew, 
an awareness bubbles up in me that I'm a little nervous to see Kimberly. I don't know what her reaction to Harden and me getting back together will be. She's not judgmental, but flipping the situation around, I don't know what my reaction would be if it were her going through the same thing with Christian. She doesn't know all of the details, but she knows they're bad enough for me to keep them from her. With a steaming mug in hand, I walk over to the large window in the living room. The snow is falling in thick clusters, I wish it would stop already. I hate driving in the snow, and most of the way to Vance is freeway. Morning. Hardin's voice startles me from the hall. Morning. I smile and take another sip of my coffee. Shouldn't you be sleeping? I ask him as he wipes the sleep from his eyes. Shouldn't you be dressed? He retaliates. I smile and walk past him toward the bedroom to get myself dressed, but he tugs on the towel and pulls it from my body, making me shriek and rush into the room. Hearing footsteps behind me, I lock the door. God knows what will happen if I let him in. My skin flames at the thought, but I don't have time for that right now. Nice, very mature, he says through the wood. I never claim to be mature. I smile and pad to the closet, where I decide on a long black skirt and red blouse. Not my most flattering outfit, but it's my first day back and it's snowing. After I put light makeup on in the full-length mirror in the closet, all I have left to do is dry my hair. When I open the door, Hardin is nowhere to be found. I quickly half-dry my hair before pulling it back into a secure bun. Hardin? I grab my purse and take out my phone to call him. No answer. Where is he? My heart begins to pound as I walk through the apartment. After a minute, the front door clicks open and he steps inside, covered in snow. Where were you? I was getting nervous. Nervous? Of what? He asks. I don't know, really. That you were hurt or something? I sound ridiculous. I was just scraping and starting your car for you, so it's warm and ready when you get down there. He shrugs off his jacket and removes his soaked boots, leaving a puddle of slush on the concrete. I can't hide my surprise. Who are you? I laugh. Don't start that shit, or I'll go back down and slash your tires, he says. I roll my eyes and laugh at his empty threat. Well, thank you. I, I can drive you? His eyes meet mine. Now I really don't know who he is. He was polite for the most part yesterday, and now he's heating my car and offering to drive me to work, not to mention the way he laughed so hard last night that his eyes were brimming with moisture. Honesty really does look good on him. Or not, he adds when I take too long to reply. I would love it, I say, and he puts his boots back on. When we get downstairs and start pulling out of the lot, Hardin remarks, good thing your car is that shit, or someone could have stolen it while it was down here running. It is not shit. I defend, eyeing the small crack in the passenger window. Anyway, I was thinking next week. When classes start back up we can drive to campus together, right? Your classes are around the same times as mine, and on the days I go to Vance, I'll just take my car and meet you back at home. Okay he stares ahead out the windshield. What? I just wish you'd have told me what classes you were taking. Why? I don't know maybe I could have taken one with you instead of just you and Landon signing up together and becoming eternal study buddies. You've already taken French and American lit, and I didn't think you'd be interested in world religion. I'm not, he huffs. I know this conversation isn't going to go anywhere, so when I see the big V on the Vance building, I'm grateful. The snow has slowed, but Hardin pulls up close to the front door to minimize my exposure to the cold. I'll be here to get you at four, he says, and I nod, before leaning across the small space to kiss him goodbye. Thank you for driving me, I whisper against his lips, touching them once more. Mmm he mumbles, and I pull away. When I step out of the car, Trevor appears only a few feet away, his black suit speckled with white snow. My stomach churns as he gives me a warm smile. Hey, long time no, Tess. Hardin calls my name and shuts the car door to walk around to my side. Trevor's eyes go to Hardin, then back to me and his smile disappears. You forgot something Hardin says, handing me a pen. A pen? I raise my eyebrow. He nods and wraps his arms around my waist, 
pressing his lips forcefully against mine. If we weren't in a parking lot, and I didn't feel like this was his sick way of marking his territory, I would melt under the aggressive manner with which his tongue parts my lips. When I pull away, his face holds a smug expression. I shiver and rub my hands over my arms. I should have worn a heavier jacket. Nice to see you. Trenton, was it? Hardin says with false sincerity. I know damn well he knows his name. He's so rude. Ah uh, yeah. Nice to see you too, Trevor mumbles and disappears through the sliding doors. What the hell was that? I scowl at Hardin. What? He smirks. I groan. You're such a pig. Stay away from him, Tess. Please, Hardin commands, kissing me on the forehead to soften his harsh words. I roll my eyes and stomp inside the building like a child. How was your Christmas? Kimberly asks as I grab a donut and coffee. I probably shouldn't drink another cup, but Hardin's caveman act has annoyed me, and the smell of the coffee beans alone calms me. And oh, you know, I took Hardin back, then found out he made sex tapes with multiple girls, ruining one of their lives, but then I took him back again. My mother showed up at my apartment and caused a scene, so now she and I aren't speaking. Hardin's mother was in town, so we had to pretend we were together, even though we weren't, which basically brought us back together, and it was smooth sailing until my mother told his mother about him taking my virginity for a bet. Oh, and Christmas? To commemorate that holiday, Hardin beat the shit out of his dad and punched his hand through a glass cabinet. You know, the usual. Was great. How was yours? I say, going with the short version. Kimberly dives into her amazing Christmas with Christian and his son. The little boy cried when he saw the new bicycle that Santa brought him. He had even called Kimberly Mommy Kim, which made her heart warm, but made her slightly uncomfortable at the same time. It's strange, you know, she says. Thinking of myself as someone's guardian, or whatever I am. I'm not married, not even engaged, to Christian, so I don't know my place with Smith. I think Smith and Christian are both lucky to have you in their lives, whatever title you may have, I assure her. You're wise beyond your years, Ms. Young. She smiles, and I rush to my office, after glancing at the clock. By the time lunch comes around, Kimberly's not at her desk. When the elevator stops at the third floor, I silently scream as Trevor steps into it. Hey, I say, my voice small. I don't know why this is so uncomfortable. It's not like I was dating Trevor or anything. We went on one date, and I had a nice time. I enjoy his company, and he enjoys mine. That is all. How was your break, he asks, his blue eyes shining under the fluorescent lighting. I wish people would stop asking me that today. Nice. Yours? It was nice, had a huge turnout at the shelter downtown, fed over 300 people. He beams proudly. Wow, 300 people? That's incredible. I smile. He's so kind, and the tension between us is somewhat diminished. It was really great. Hopefully next year we'll have even more resources and we can feed 500. As we both step off the elevator he asks, are you going to lunch? Yeah, I was going to walk over to Firehouse, since I didn't drive myself, I say, not wanting to discuss Hardin and me at the moment. You can ride with me if you want. I'm going to Panera but I can run you by firehouse first. You shouldn't walk in the snow, he offers politely. Do you know? Panera's good. I'll just come with. I smile, and we head to his car. The heated seats in his BMW warm me up before we're even out of the parking lot. At the eatery, Trevor and I stay mostly silent while we order our lunch and sit down at a small table toward the back. I'm thinking about moving to Seattle, Trevor tells me as I dip a cracker into my broccoli soup. Really? When? I ask loudly, trying to speak over the many. Voices of the lunch crowd. March. Christian has offered me a job there, a promotion to head of finance at the new branch, and I'm strongly considering taking it. That's really great news, congratulations, Trevor. He wipes the corners of his mouth with a napkin. Thank you. I would love to run the entire finance department, and even more, I'd love to move to Seattle. We talk about Seattle for the rest of the meal, 
and by the time we finish, all I can think is why can't Harden feel the same about Seattle? When we get back to Vance, the snow has turned to freezing rain, and the two of us rush into the building. I'm shivering by the time we reach the elevator. Trevor offers me his suit jacket, but I quickly decline. So you and Harden are seeing each other again? He finally asks, a question I have been waiting for. Yeah, we are working through things. I chew on my cheek. Oh, you're happy, then? He looks down at me. I look up at him. Yeah. Well, I'm happy for you. He runs his hands over his black hair, and I know he's lying, but I appreciate him not making this any more awkward than it already is. That's part of his goodness too. When we step off of the elevator, Kimberly's face holds a strange expression. I'm confused by the way she's looking at Trevor, until I follow her eyes to where Hardin is leaning against the wall. Chapter 54. Hardin. Really? Really? I ask, my hands flying into the air dramatically. Tessa's mouth falls open, but no words come out as she looks at fucking Trevor, then back to me. Goddammit, Tessa. Anger courses through me, and I begin to envision the multiple ways I want to beat the shit out of this boy. Thanks for lunch, Tessa. See you later, Trevor calmly says before walking away. When I look at Kimberly, she shakes her head in disapproval before grabbing a folder off her desk and leaving us alone. Tessa glares at her friend, and I almost laugh. Tessa defends herself and walks toward her office. We just got lunch, Hardin. I can have lunch with whoever I want to. So do not start with me, she warns. As soon as we're both inside, I close and lock her door. You know how I feel about him. I lean against the wall. You need to be quiet. This is my job. Internship, I correct her. What? Her eyes open wide. You're not an actual employee, just an intern, I say. So we're back to this, then? No, I was just stating a fact. I'm an asshole, another fact. Really? She challenges. I clench my jaw and stare at my stubborn girl. Why are you even here? She asks me, and sits down in her chair behind her desk. I came to take you to lunch, so you didn't have to go out in the snow, I say. But it seems like you know how to get other guys to help you out. It's not that big of a deal. We went to eat and came right back. You need to calm down with the jealousy. It's not jealousy. Of course it's jealousy. And fear. But I'm not admitting that. We are friends, Hardin. Let it go and come here. No, I whine. Please, she begs and I roll my eyes at my lack of self-control as I walk over to her. She leans against her desk, and pulls me to stand in front of her. I only want you, Hardin. I love you and I do not want to be with anyone else, only you. She stares at me with such intensity, that I look away. I'm sorry that you don't like him, but you can't tell me who I can be friends with. When she smiles at me, I try to hold on to my anger, but feel it slowly slipping. Damn. Is she good? I can't stand him. He's harmless. Really. Besides, he's moving to Seattle in March. Ice fills my veins, but I try to remain neutral. He is. Of course fucking Trevor is moving to Seattle, the place Tessa wants to be. The place I am not moving to and never will. I wonder if she's thought about going with him? No, she wouldn't. Would she? Fuck, I don't know. Yeah, so he won't be around. Please just leave him alone. She squeezes my hands. I look down at her. Fine. Fuck, fine. I won't touch him. I sigh. I can't believe I just agreed to let him get away with trying to kiss her. Thank you. I love you so much, she tells me, her blue-gray eyes staring into mine. I'm still mad at him for trying to seduce you. And you for not listening to me. I know. Now be quiet she licks her bottom lip. Let me set you at ease, she asks with a shaky voice. What? I want to show you that I love only you. Her cheeks flush deep crimson, and her hands move to my belt as she stands on her toes to kiss me. I am confused, angry, and incredibly turned on. She runs her tongue over my bottom lip. I groan immediately and lift her onto the desk. Her trembling hands fumble with my belt again, this time removing it. I lift the bottom of her ridiculously long skirt up to the tops of her thighs, thankful that she didn't wear tights today. I want you, 
babe, she breathes against my neck, wrapping her legs around my waist. I moan at the way those words sound coming from her full lips, and I'm loving her sudden dominance as she takes control, tugging my jeans down my legs. Aren't you? I ask, referring to her period. Yeah you aren't. She blushes and takes my length into her hand. I hiss, and she smiles while pumping slowly, too slowly. Don't tease me. I groan and she works her hand faster as she sucks the skin on my neck. If this is her way of making amends to me, I welcome her to fuck up more often. As long as it doesn't involve her and another guy. I pull her head back by her hair to look at me. I want to fuck you. She shakes her head no, and a shy smile plays on her lips. Yes. We can't. She looks toward the door. We have before. I mean because of you know. It's not so bad. I shrug. It really isn't as bad as people assume it is. Is that normal? Yes. It's normal, I decree, and her eyes widen. Despite how shy she's acting, her pupils are blown out, letting me know how bad she wants it too. Her hand remains on me, slowly moving, and I spread her legs farther. I tug on the string of her tampon and dispose of it in the trash, then, moving her hand away, roll the condom on. She climbs down, then bends over the desk, lifting her skirt up over her ass. Fuck if this isn't the hottest thing I've seen in my entire life, despite the circumstances. Chapter 55. Tessa. Anticipation builds as hard and pushes the thick material of my skirt farther up my waist. Relax, Tess. Shut your mind off, it's not going to be any. Different than it usually is, Hardin promises. I'm trying to hide my embarrassment as he slides into me, it doesn't feel any different. Well, if anything, it actually feels better. More daring. Doing something so out of my norm, so taboo, makes it all the more exciting. Hardin's hand runs down my spine, making me shiver in anticipation. His mood is totally shifted. Given his stance when I came out of the elevator, I had expected him to cause a much bigger scene. Are you okay? He asks. I nod, moaning an answer. One of his hands digs into my hip as the other grips my hair, holding me in place. You feel so good, so good, baby. His voice is tight as he slowly drags himself in and out of me. Hardin's hand moves from my hair down to my breasts. He tugs at the neckline of my blouse, exposing my chest. His hand finds my nipple, tugging at it gently, before he rolls it between his fingers. I gasp and arch my back as he repeats the action over and over. Oh God, I utter, then clamp my mouth shut. I'm aware that we are in my office, but I can't seem to worry in the way that I normally would. My thoughts begin with Hardin and end with pleasure. The reality of this and the taboo around our act isn't relevant to me right now. Feels good, doesn't it, baby? I told you, nothing different well, nothing different bad, at least. He moans and wraps his arm around my waist. I nearly slip from the edge of the desk as he changes positions, resting my back against the hardwood of my desk. I fucking love you, you know that, don't you? Hardin pants into my ear. I nod, but I know that he needs more. Say it, he insists. I know you love me, I assure him. My body is tightening, and he straightens his back, bringing his fingers to rub over my clit. I lean up trying to watch his fingers work their magic on my body, but the sensation is too much. Come, baby, go on. Hardin picks up the pace and lifts one of my legs higher into the air. His eyes roll back in his head. My release is so close, so intense, and so overpowering, that I can't see anything but stars as I grip his inked arms. I press my lips together, hard, to keep from calling out his name as I come undone. Hardin's release isn't as compassed, he leans down, burying his head in my neck, calling my name once, before pressing his mouth into my skin to silence his voice. Hardin pulls out, places a kiss on my ear. I stand up, and adjust my clothes, figuring I should get to the restroom soon. God, this is weird. I can't deny, that I enjoyed it, but it's hard to get past the idea, that has been so ingrained in my mind. Ready? He asks. For what? I say, my breathing ragged. To go home. I can't go home. It's only two. I gesture to the clock on the wall. 
Call Vance's office on our way out. Come home with me, Hardin instructs and grabs my purse from my desk. Though you may want to replug yourself before we go. He pulls a tampon from my purse and taps me on the nose with it. I swat his arm. Stop saying that. I groan, stuffing it back into my bag as he laughs. Three days later, I'm waiting patiently for Hardin to pick me up, staring out the large glass windows in the lobby, thankful that it hasn't snowed of late. The only evidence of the snowfall from days before is the black sludge littering the dips in the sidewalk. Much to my annoyance, Hardin has insisted on driving me to work every day since our fight over Trevor. I'm still surprised that I was able to calm him down the way that I did. I don't know what I would have done if he'd assaulted Trevor in the office, Kimberly would have been forced to call security, and Hardin surely would have been arrested. Hardin was supposed to be here at 4.30, and it's now 5.15. Nearly everyone has left for the day, and multiple people have offered to give me a ride home, including Trevor, though he did say it from about 10 dozen feet away. I don't want things to be awkward between us, and I would still like to be friends, despite Hardin's orders. Finally Hardin's car pulls into the lot, and I step outside into the chilling wind. It is warmer today than it has been, the bright sun adding a small amount of warmth, but not enough. Sorry for being late, I fell asleep, he tells me as I climb into the warm car. It's okay, I assure him, and stare out the window. I'm slightly nervous about New Year's Eve tonight, and don't want to add fighting with Hardin to my list of stressors today. We haven't decided what we are actually doing yet, which drives me insane, I want to know the details and have the entire night planned. I've been debating whether or not to reply to the text messages that Steph sent me a couple days ago. Part of me really wants to see her, to show her and everyone that they did not break me, though they humiliated me, yes, and that I'm stronger than they think. That being said, the other half of me thinks it will be incredibly awkward to see Hardin's friends. I know they'll probably think I'm an idiot for being with him again. I won't know how to act around them, and honestly I'm afraid that everything will be different when Hardin and I are not in our own small bubble. What if he ignores me the entire time, or what if Molly's there? My blood boils at the thought. Where do you want to go, he asks. I had earlier mentioned that I needed something to wear tonight, so I say, the mall is fine. We need to decide where we're going, so I know what to get. Do you really want to hang out with everyone, or just go out, the two of us? I'm still rooting for staying in. I don't want to stay in, we stay in all the time. I smile. I love staying in with Hardin, but he used to be out all the time, and sometimes I worry, if I keep him in the house too much, he'll get bored with me. When we arrive at the mall, Hardin drops me off at the entrance to Macy's and I hurry inside. By the time he joins me, I already have three dresses draped over my arms. What is that? Hardin scrunches his nose at the canary yellow dress on top. That color is hideous, he says. Do you find every color hideous, apart from black, of course. He shrugs at my truthful statement and runs his finger along the fabric of the gold dress underneath. I like this one, he says. Really? That was the one I was unsure about. I don't want to stand out, you know? He arches his brow. And you wouldn't be standing out in yellow? He has a point. I place the yellow dress back on the rack and hold up a white strapless, then ask, what about this one? You should try them on, he suggests with a cheeky smile. Pervert, I tease. Always. He smirks and follows me to the dressing room. You are not coming in here, I scold him, and close the door to the stall, leaving just enough room to pop my head out. He pouts before taking a seat on the black leather couch outside the dressing room. I want to see each one, he calls when I close the door the rest of the way. Be quiet. I hear him chuckle, and I want to open the door, just to see his smile, but I decide against it. I put the white strapless dress on first, and struggle to zip it up the back, tight, too tight and short, way too short. Finally I get the thin fabric to zip, and I tug at the bottom of the dress, before opening the door to the dressing room. Pardon? I almost whisper. Holy shit. He practically gasps when he turns the corner, and takes in the sight of me in the barely there dress. It's short. I flush. Yeah, 
You are getting that, he says as his eyes move up and down my body. If I want to, I will, I say, reminding him that he will not tell me what to wear. He glares at me for a moment before speaking. I know I just meant you shouldn't. It's too revealing for your taste. That's what I thought. I hum and look in the full length. Mirror once more. Harden smirks, and I see him check out my bottom. It is incredibly sexy, though. Next, I say and walk back into the dressing room. The gold dress feels silky against my skin despite the entire dress, being covered in tiny gold discs. It falls to the middle of my thighs, and the sleeves are quarter length. This is much more me, only a touch riskier than usual. The sleeves give the illusion of the dress being more conservative, but the way the material clings to my body, and the short length say otherwise. Tess, Harden winds impatiently from directly outside. I open the door, and his reaction makes my heart flutter. Christ. He swallows. You like it? I chew my bottom lip. I feel pretty confident in the dress, especially after Hardin's cheeks turn pink, and he shifts his weight from one foot to the other. Very much. This is such a normal couple thing to be doing, trying on clothes for him at Macy's, it feels strange yet very comforting. I was terrified a few days ago, when he found out about my dinner with Trevor in Seattle. I'm going to get this one, then, I say. After finding a pair of thick, and rather intimidating black pumps, we head to check out. Hardin pesters me to let him pay, but I refuse, this time winning the battle. You're right, you really should be buying me something you know, to make up for the lack of Christmas gifts I received, he teases as we exit the mall. I swat at his arm, but he grabs my wrist, before I can connect. His lips press a light kiss against my palm, before he encases my hand in his, and leads me to the car. Holding hands in public is never our thing, as soon as the thought crosses my mind, he seems to realize what we're doing, and drops my hand. One step at a time, I suppose. Back at the apartment, after I've declared for the eighth time, that we should hang out with his friends, my nerves begin to get the best of me as I imagine the possibilities, of how the night could turn out. But we can't hide from the world forever. How Hardin behaves around his old friends will really show me, how he truly feels about me, about us. When I shower, I shave my legs three times, staying under the hot water until it is no longer warm. When I get out, I ask Hardin, what did Nate say about tonight? I'm unsure what I want the answer to be. He texted to meet them at the house my old house. At nine. They're having a big thing, apparently. I glance at the clock, already seven. Okay, I'll be ready. I do my makeup and blow dry my hair quickly. My hair is in tight curls, and I pin my bangs back as usual. I look nice boring. Boring. The same as I always do. I need to look better than ever before for my comeback. This is my way of showing them that they didn't get the best of me. If Molly is there, she'll certainly be dressed to get attention, including Hardin's. And as much as I hate her, she's gorgeous. Molly's pink hair burning in the back of my mind, I grab my black eyeliner and draw a thick line across my top eyelid, for once the line is straight, blessedly. I do the same on the bottom, and add more pink to my cheeks, before pulling the bobby pin from my hair, and tossing it in the trash. Quickly, I retrieve the pin from the top of the trash. Okay, so maybe I'm not quite ready to throw it away yet, but I'll skip it tonight. I flip my head down and rake my fingers through my tight curls. The reflection in the mirror shocks me. She looks like she belongs in a nightclub, she looks wild and sexy, even. The last time that I wore this much makeup was when Steph gave me a makeover and Hardin taunted me. This time, I look even better. It's 8.30, Tess. Hardin warns me from the living room. I check the mirror one last time and take a deep breath before rushing to the bedroom to get dressed before Hardin can see me. What if he thinks I look bad? Last time he didn't care for my new and improved look. I shut off my doubtful thoughts, and pull the dress over my head, zip it up, and step into my new. Pumps. Maybe I should wear tights? No. I need to calm down and stop overthinking this. Tessa, we really need, Hardin's voice gets louder as he comes into the room, but then stops mid-sentence. Do I look? Yes, fuck yes, he practically growls. 
You don't think it's too much, all the makeup? No, it's um it's nice, I mean it's good, he stammers. I try not to laugh at his apparent loss for words, something that never occurs with him. Let's go we need to go now, or we won't make it out of this apartment, he mutters. His reaction has given my confidence an extreme boost. I know it shouldn't, but it does. He looks flawless as usual, wearing a simple black t-shirt and snug black jeans. The black converses I've quickly become fond of complete the look I know is Hardin. Chapter 56. Tessa. The fray quietly sings about forgiveness as we pull up to Hardin's old fraternity house. The drive here was nerve-wracking, and both of us stayed silent. Memories, mostly bad memories, flood my mind, but I push them back. Hardin and I are in a relationship now, a real one, so he'll be different now. Won't he? Hardin stays close to me as we walk through the crowded house to the smoke-filled living room. Red cups are immediately placed in our hands, but Hardin discards his quickly, before taking mine from me. I reach to take it back, and he frowns. I don't think we should drink tonight, he says. I don't think you should drink tonight. Fine, only one, he warns and hands me back the cup. Scott, a familiar voice calls. Nate appears in the kitchen and pats Hardin's shoulder, before giving me a friendly smile. I'd almost forgotten how cute he is. I try to picture what he'd look like without tattoos and piercings, but I can't seem to do it. Wow, Tessa, you look different, he says. Hardin rolls his eyes and grabs my drink from my hand to take a sip. I want to take it from him, but I don't want to cause a fight. One drink won't hurt. I slide my phone into Hardin's back pocket, so I can hold my cup more easily. Well 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 look who it is, a female voice says at the same time as a mop of pink hair steps around a big round guy. Great. Hardin groans as Molly the skank walks toward us. Long time no see, Hardin, she says with a sinister grin. Yep. He takes another drink from the cup. Her eyes move to me. Oh, Tessa. I didn't see you there, she says with obvious sarcasm. I ignore her, and Nate hands me a new drink. Did you miss me? Molly asks Hardin. She's wearing more than usual, which is to say she's still barely clothed. Her black shirt is ripped down the front, purposely, I assume. Her red shorts are incredibly short, with tears in the fabric going up the sides, revealing even more pale skin. Not so much, Hardin says without looking at her. I bring the cup to my lips to hide my smirk. I'm sure you did, she responds. Fuck off, he groans. She rolls her eyes like it's all a game. Geez, someone is pissy. Come on, Tessa. Hardin grabs my hand and pulls me away. We walk to the kitchen, leaving an annoyed Molly and the laughing Nate behind. Tessa. Steph squeals as she jumps up from one of the couches. Damn, girl. You look so hot. Wow. Then she adds, I would actually wear that. Thanks. I smile. It's a little awkward seeing Steph, but not nearly as bad as seeing Molly. I have honestly missed Steph, and I'm hoping that tonight goes smoothly enough that we can explore the possibility of rebuilding our friendship. She hugs me. I'm glad you came. I'm going to go talk to Logan, stay right here, Hardin. Instructs before walking away. Steph eyes him with humor. Rude as ever, I see. She laughs loudly over the raucous music and partygoers' voices. Yes and things never change. I smile and gulp down the remainder of the sweet drink in my cup. I hate to think about it, but the taste of cherries reminds me of my kiss with said. His mouth was cold, and his tongue sweet. It seems like another world, another Tessa, who shared that kiss with him. As if Steph can read my thoughts, she taps my shoulder. There said. Have you seen him since you know? She points her zebra print nail at a black-haired boy. No I haven't seen anyone, really. Except Hardin. Zed felt like such an ass after everything. I almost felt sorry for him, she says. Can we talk about something else please? I beg as his eyes meet mine, and I look away. Oh yeah, shit, sorry. Want another drink, she asks. I smile to minimize the tension. Yes, definitely. I glance around the kitchen to where Zed was previously standing, but he's gone. 
I chew on the inside of my cheek and look back at Steph, who is staring into her cup. Neither of us knows what exactly to say. Let's go find Tristan, she suggests. Hart and I begin to say that he asked me to stay put. But he didn't ask, he demanded, which is annoying. I tip back my cup, gulping down the remainder of the cold drink. My cheeks are already getting warm from the alcohol running through me my nerves are slightly calmer as I reach for yet another cup before following Steph into the living room. The house is more crowded than I've ever seen it, and Hardin is nowhere to be found. Half of the living room has been taken over by a long card table filled with rows of red cups. Drunk college students throw ping-pong balls into the cups and then swallow the contents down. I'll never understand the need for them to play all sorts of games when they're intoxicated, but at least this one doesn't seem to involve kissing. I spot Tristan sitting on the couch next to a redheaded guy who I remember seeing here before. He was smoking a joint with Jace the last time I saw him. Zed is seated on the arm of the couch and says something to the group, causing Tristan's head to fall back from laughter. When Tristan looks up at Steph walking toward him, he smiles. I've liked Nate's roommate from the first time I met him. He's sweet, and he seems to really care for Steph. How are things between the two of you? I ask her, before we approach them. She turns her whole body to me and beams. Great, actually. I think I love him. Think? Do you guys haven't said it yet? I gasp. No god no. We've only been dating three months. Oh Hardin and I said the words, before we were dating at all. You and Hardin are different, she says quickly, only lending support to my suspicions that she can read my thoughts. How are you two, she asks, then looks past me. Good, we are good. It's great to be able to say, since we are good, for once. You two are really the oddest couple. I chuckle. Yeah, we are. It's a good thing, though. Could you imagine, if Hardin were to find a girl like him? I would never want to meet her, that's for sure. She laughs. Me either, I say and join in her laughter. Tristan waves to Steph, and she pads over to take a seat on his lap. There's my girl. He gives her a swift kiss on the cheek, then looks at me. And how are you, Tessa? I am very well. How are you? I ask. I sound like a politician. Relax, Tessa. Fine. Drunk as shit, but fine. He laughs. Where's Hardin? I haven't seen him, the boy with the red hair asks me. He's well, I have no idea, I answer and shrug. I'm sure he's around here somewhere. I don't see him going far from you, Steph says to try and comfort me. Actually, I don't mind that I haven't seen Hardin in a while, because the alcohol is making me less nervous, but I do wish he would return and hang out with me. These are all his friends, not mine. Except Steph, who I'm still deciding on. But right now she's the person that I know the best, and I don't want to stand here awkward and alone. Someone bumps into me, and I stumble forward slightly. Luckily my drink is empty, so when the cup hits the already stained carpet, only a few drops of pink liquid dot the surface. Shit, sorry, a drunk girl stutters. It's fine, really, I respond. Her black hair is so shiny that it literally makes me squint. How is that even possible? I must be more intoxicated than I thought. Come sit down before you get trampled over, Steph teases, and I laugh, before taking a seat on the edge of the couch. So did you hear about Jace? Tristan asks. No, what about him? The mention of his name makes my stomach turn. He got arrested, then just got out of jail yesterday, he explains. What? Really? What did he do? I ask. He killed someone, the redeed answers. Oh my god. I gasp, and everyone begins to laugh. My voice is much louder now that I'm on the verge of being intoxicated. He's just fucking with you. He got pulled over, and had some pot on him. Tristan laughs. You are such a dick, Ed, Steph says, and swats the guy's arm, but I can't help but laugh at how quickly I believed him. You should have seen your face. Tristan laughs again. Another 30 minutes go by with no sign of Hardin. I'm getting slightly annoyed by his absence, but the more I drink, the less I care. Some of that is due to the fact 
that Molly is within eye shot, and I can see she's found herself a blonde plaything for the night. His hand keeps snaking up her thighs, and they're both so drunk they look sloppy and ridiculous. Still, better him than Harden. Who's up now? Kyle has obviously had enough, a guy with glasses says, gesturing to his drunken friend who is lying in the fetal position on the carpet. I look over at the table lined with cups, and put two and two together. I'll play. Tristan shouts, gently pushing Steph off his lap. Me too, she chimes in. You know you aren't very good, Tristan teases her. I am too. You're actually just mad, but I'm better at it than you. But I'm on your team now, so there's no need to be intimidated. She bats her lashes playfully, and he shakes his head. Tess, you should play, she yells over the music. Um no, I'm okay. I have no idea what they're playing, but I know I would be terrible at it. Oh, come on. It'll be fun. She brings her hands into a praying motion to beg. What is it? Beer pong, duh. She shrugs dramatically, before bursting into drunken laughter. You've never played, huh? She adds. No, I don't like beer. We can use the cherry vodka sour mix instead. They literally have gallons made. I'll grab one from the fridge. She turns to Tristan. Line up the cups, boy. I want to protest but at the same time I want to have fun tonight. I want to be carefree and let loose. Beer pong may not be so bad. It can't possibly be worse than sitting on that couch alone waiting for Hardin to come back from wherever the hell he is. Tristan begins to put the cups back into a triangular formation that reminds me of bowling pins. Are you going to play? He asks. I guess. I don't know how, though, I tell him. Who wants to be her partner? Tristan asks. I feel foolish when no one speaks up. Great. I knew this was, Zed. Tristan says, interrupting my thoughts. Er I don't know Zed responds, not looking at me. He's been avoiding me the entire time that I've been here. Just one round, man. Zed's caramel eyes flicker to me quickly, before moving back to Tristan and giving in. Okay, yeah, one game. He comes and stands next to me and we both stay there silently as Steph fills the cups with the alcohol. These cups have been used all night? I ask her, trying to hide my disgust at multiple mouths drinking from them. It's fine. She laughs. The alcohol kills the germs. I notice Zed's smile out of the corner of my eye, but when I look at him, he looks away. Yup, this is going to be a long game. Chapter 57. Tessa. Just toss it across the table into any of those cups, and they have to drink the cup that the ball lands into. Whichever team knocks out all the other's cups wins, Tristan explains. Wins what? I ask. Uh, nothing. You just don't get drunk as fast, because you don't have to drink as many cups. I'm about to point out that a drinking game where the winner gets less to drink seems counter to the party mentality when Steph shouts, I'll go first. She playfully rubs the small white ball against Tristan's shirt before blowing on it and tossing it across the table. It bounces off the lip of the front cup before rolling into the cup behind it. Do you want to drink first? Zed asks. Sure. I shrug and lift the cup. When Tristan tosses the next ball across the table, he misses. It falls to the floor and Zed picks it up, dipping it into the lone glass of water on our side. So that's what that is for. It's hardly sanitary, but this is a college party, what do I really expect? Yeah, I'm the one who sucks, Steph taunts Tristan, who only smiles at her. You go first, Zed instructs. My first attempt at playing beer, well, cherry vodka sour, Pong seems to be going well, given that I make my first four shots in a row. My jaw hurts from smiling and giggling at my opponents, and my blood is singing from the liquor and the fact that I love to be successful at things, even college drinking games. You've played this before. I know you have. Steph accuses me with a hand on her hip. No, I'm just skilled. I laugh. Skilled? Don't be jealous of my killer peer dong skills, I say, and everyone within a five-foot radius bursts into laughter. Oh lord. Please do not say skills again. Steph says and I hold my stomach while I try to stop laughing. 
This game was a better idea than I thought. The large amount of alcohol I've consumed helps, and I feel carefree. Young and carefree. If you make this, we'll win, I say to encourage Zed. The more cups he drinks, the more comfortable he seems to be around me. Oh, I'll make it, he boasts with a smile. The small ball cuts through the air and lands directly into Steph and Tristan's last remaining cup. I squeal and jump up and down like an idiot, but I could care less. Zed claps his hands once, and without thinking, I wrap my arms around his neck in excitement. He stumbles back a little, but his arms reach my waist, before we both pull away. It's a harmless hug, we've just won, and I'm excited. Harmless. Steph's eyes are wide, when I glance over at her, making me look around the room for Hardin. He's nowhere to be found, but so what if he was? He's the one who left me alone at this party. I can't even call or text him, because he has my phone in his pocket. I want a rematch. Steph yells. I look at Zed with wide eyes. Want to play again? He looks around the room before answering. Yeah yeah let's do another. He smiles. Zed and I win for the second time, which causes Steph and Tristan both to playfully accuse us of cheating. You okay? Zed asks as the four of us leave the table. Two games of beer pong are enough for me, I'm sort of intoxicated. Okay, more than sort of, but I feel amazing. Tristan disappears with Steph into the kitchen. Yeah, I'm good. Really good. I'm having a great time, I tell him, and he laughs. The way his tongue rests behind his teeth when he smiles is so charming. That's good. If you excuse me, though, I'm going to go get some air, he says. Air. I would love to breathe an air that isn't thick with cigarette smoke or the smell of sweat. It's hot in this house, too hot. Can I come? I ask. Um I don't know, if that's a good idea, he replies, looking away from me. Oh okay. My cheeks flame in embarrassment. I turn to walk away, but he gently grabs my arm. You can come. I just don't want to start any trouble between you and Hardin. Hardin isn't here, and I can be friends with whoever I want, Isler. My voice sounds funny, and I can't help but giggle at how weird it sounds. You're quite drunk, aren't you? He asks and opens the door for me. A smittle, a small a little. I laugh. The crisp winter air feels amazing and refreshing. Zed and I walk through the yard and end up sitting on the broken stone wall that used to be my favorite spot during these parties. There are only a few people outside because of the cold. One of them is throwing up in the bushes a few yards away. Lovely, I groan. Zed chuckles but doesn't say anything. The stone is cold against my thighs, but I have a jacket in Hardin's car, if I need it. Not that I have any idea where he is. I can see his car is still here but he's been gone for over well, two beer pongs plus. When I look over at Zed, he's staring off into the darkness. Why is this so awkward? His hand moves to his stomach, and he appears to be scratching the skin. When he lifts his shirt up slightly, I see a white bandage. What's that? I ask nosily. A tattoo. I just got it done, before I came here. Can I see it? Yeah he shrugs his jacket off, and sets it down next to him then pulls back the tape and bandage. It's dark over here, he says, pulling out his phone, to use the screen as a light. Clockwork? I ask him. Without thinking, I run my index finger across the ink. He flinches but doesn't move away. The tattoo is large, covering most of the skin on his stomach. The rest of his skin is covered by smaller, seemingly random tattoos. The new tattoo is a cluster of gears, they appear to be moving but I'm going to say that's just the vodka. My finger is still tracing his warm skin when I suddenly realize what I'm doing. Sorry I squeak and jerk my hand away. It's fine, but, yeah, it's sort of like clockwork. See how the skin appears to be torn right here? He points to the edges of the tattoo, and I nod. He shrugs. It's like when the skin is pulled back, what is underneath is mechanical. Like I'm a robot or something. Who's robot? I don't know why I ask that. Societies, I guess. Oh is all I say. That's a much more complex answer than I expected. That's actually really cool. I get it. I smile, my head swimming from the alcohol. I don't know 
If people will get the whole concept. You're the only person so far that gets it. How many more tattoos do you want? I ask. I don't know. I don't have any more room on my arms, and now my stomach, so I guess I'll stop when there isn't any room. He laughs. I should get a tattoo, I blurt. Do you? He laughs loudly. Yeah. Why not? I say with joke indignation. Getting a tattoo sounds like a good idea at the moment. I have no idea what I would get, but it sounds fun. Adventurous and fun. I think you drank way too much, he teases, rubbing his fingers over the tape to reattach the bandage to his skin. You don't think I could handle it? I challenge. No, it's not that. I just I don't know. I can't imagine you having a tattoo. What would you even get? He tries not to laugh. I don't know like a sun? Or a smiley face? A smiley face? This is definitely the vodka talking here. Probably. I giggle. Then, when I'm quiet, I say, I thought you were mad at me. His expression changes from laughing to neutral. Why did you think that, he asks quietly. Because you avoided me until Tristan made you play beer pong. He lets out a breath. Oh I wasn't avoiding you, Tessa. I just don't want to cause any problems. With who? Harden? I ask, though I already know the answer. Yeah. He made it clear that I need to stay away from you, and I don't want to fight him again. I don't want any more trouble between us, or with you. I just never mind. He's getting better, sort of, anger-wise, I say awkwardly. I don't know if that's true, exactly, but I would like to think him not killing Trevor already says something. He looks at me doubtfully. Is he? Yeah, he is. I think, where is he, anyway? I was surprised he let you out of his sight. I have no idea, I say and look around, as if that would help. He went to talk with Logan, and I haven't seen him since. He nods and scratches his stomach. Weird. Yes, weird. I laugh, thankful that vodka seems to make everything much more amusing. Steph was really happy to see you tonight, he says as he puts a cigarette to his lips. A quick flick of his thumb brings a lighter flame to life, and soon the smell of nicotine invades my nostrils. I could tell. And I've missed her, but I'm still upset over everything that happened. The topic doesn't feel as heavy as it did before. I'm having a great time, even though Hardin isn't around. I laughed and joked with Steph, and for the first time it felt like I could put all of this behind me and move forward with her. You're brave for coming here, he tells me with a smile. Stupid and brave aren't the same thing, I joke. I mean it. After everything you didn't hide away somewhere. I probably would have. I did hide for a little while, but he found me. I always do. Hardin's voice startles me, and I grip onto Zed's jacket to prevent myself from falling off the stone wall. Chapter 58. Hardin. My words are true. I do always find her. I usually find her doing things that drive me fucking mad, like hanging out with fucking Trevor or Zed. I can't fucking believe that I came out here to find Tessa and Zed sitting on a wall talking about her hiding from me. This is bullshit. She latches onto Zed to steady herself as I stride across the frozen grass. Hardin, Tessa squeaks, clearly surprised by my presence. Yeah, Hardin, I say. Zed scoots away from her, and I try to stay calm. Why the hell is she out here with Zed alone? I specifically told her to stay inside, in the kitchen. When I asked Steph where the hell Tessa was, all she said was Zed. After five minutes of searching the entire fucking house, mostly the bedrooms, I finally looked outside. And here they are. Together. You were supposed to stay in the kitchen, I say, adding babe to soften my harsh tongue. You were supposed to be right back baby. I sigh and take a deep breath before speaking again. I always react to every impulse that I get and I'm trying not to do that. Anymore. But fuck if she doesn't make it difficult. Let's go inside, I say and reach for her hand. I need to get her away from Zed, and honestly, I need to get myself away from him as well. I've already beat the shit out of him once, and something in me wouldn't mind doing it again. I'm going to get a tattoo, Hardin, Tess tells me as I help her down from the wall. What? Is he drunk? Yeah you should see Zed's new tattoo. 
Hardin. It's so nice. She smiles. Show him, said. Why the fuck was Tessa looking at his tattoos, and how much did I miss? What else were they doing? What else was he showing her? He has wanted her since the first time he met her, just like I did. The difference being that I wanted to fuck her, and he actually liked her. But I won. She chose me. I don't said begins, visibly uncomfortable. No, no. Go on, show me please, I say sarcastically. Zed blows out some smoke, and, to my horror and absolute fucking annoyance, lifts his shirt up. Moving the bandage aside, I see that the tattoo itself is actually pretty cool, but why he felt the need to show my Tessa this shit is beyond me. Tessa beams. Isn't it cool? I want one. I think we decided on a smiley face. She isn't serious. I pull my lip ring between my teeth to prevent myself from laughing at her. I look at Zed, who just shakes his head and shrugs. Some of my annoyance disappears at a ridiculous idea for a tattoo. Are you drunk? I ask her. Maybe. She giggles. Great. How much did you drink? I ask. I had two drinks, but I can tell she's had more. I don't know how much did you drink, she teases, and lifts up the bottom of my shirt. Her cold hands rest against my hot skin, and I flinch, before she nuzzles her head on my chest. See, said, she's mine. Not yours, not anyone's, only mine. Looking at him, I ask, how much did she drink? I'm not sure how much she drank before, but we just played two games of beer pong with cherry vodka sour. Wait we? Do you two play beer pong? I ask through my teeth. Nope. Cherry vodka sour pong, she corrects me with a laugh, and brings her head up. We won two, twice. I made most of the shots. Steph and Tristan were both pretty good, but we beat them. Twice. She holds her hand up like said should high five it, and he begrudgingly does a sort of air high five from where he stands. This is Tessa, the girl who is so used to being the best and smartest at everything, that she's boasting over winning a game of beer pong. I love every bit of it. Straight vodka? I ask said. No, it's the mix with only a little vodka, but she had a lot of it. And you brought her out here in the dark, when you knew she was wasted. I say, raising my voice. Tessa brings her face close to mine, and I can smell the vodka and mix on her breath. Hardin, please chill out. I'm the one who asked him if I could see come outside with him. He told me no at first, because he knew you'd act like like this. She frowns and tries to remove her hands from my bare stomach, but I gently put them back against my skin. I wrap my arms around her waist, pulling her even closer to me. Chill out? Did she really just tell me to chill out? And let's not forget, if you wouldn't have left me, we see could have been beer pong partners, she adds, slurring. I know she's right, but she's pissing me off. How could she play with said, of all people? I know he has feelings for her still. Nothing compared to what I feel, but I can tell by the way he's looking at her, that he cares for her. Am I right, or am I right, she asks. Okay, Tessa, I growl in an attempt to silence her. I'm going to go inside, said says, tossing his cigarette onto the ground before walking away. Tessa watches him, then says to me, you are so grumpy, maybe you should go back to wherever you ran off to. She tries to pull away from me again. I'm not going anywhere, I respond, purposely dodging her remark about my absence. Then stop being grumpy, because I'm having fun tonight. She looks up at me. Her eyes appear even lighter than usual with the black lines she colored around them. You couldn't have expected me to be happy to find you alone with that motherfucker. Would you rather me being out here with someone else? She's awfully testy when she's drunk. No, you're missing the point here, I snap. There's no point. I didn't do anything wrong, so stop being an ass, or I don't want to hang out with you, she threatens. Fine, I won't be a grouch. I roll my eyes. No rolling your eyes either, she scolds, and I take my arms away from her waist. Fine, no eye rolling. I smile. That's what I thought. She tries to fight her smile. You are quite bossy tonight. The vodka makes me brave. I feel her hands move lower on my stomach. So you want a tattoo, then? I ask, moving her hands back up, 
but she defies my attempt and touches me even lower. Yep, maybe five. She shrugs her shoulders. I don't know. You aren't getting a tattoo. I laugh, but I'm beyond serious. Why not? Her fingers play at the hem of my boxers. Let's talk about it tomorrow when you're sober. I know this idea will not appeal to her when she's not drunk. Let's go inside. She slips her hand into my boxers and stands on her toes. I assume she's going to kiss my cheek, but she brings her mouth to my ear. I hiss as she squeezes me gently in her hand. I think we should stay out here, she whispers. Fuck. The vodka certainly makes you brave. My voice cracks, betraying me. Yes and it makes me whore, she begins to say, way too loud. I cover her mouth as a small group of drunk girls walks by. We need to get inside, it's freezing, and I don't think they would appreciate me fucking you in the bushes. I smirk, and her pupils dilate. But I would appreciate that very much, she says the moment my hand uncovers her mouth. Jesus, Tess, a few drinks and you become sex crazed. I laugh, remembering Seattle and the filthy words that fell from her full lips. I need to get her inside before I take her up on her offer and drag her into the bushes. She winks. Only for you. I can't hold in my laughter. Let's go. I put my hand on her arm and pull her across the yard and into the house. She pouts the entire time and that makes my groin ache even more, especially when she pushes her bottom lip out. I could easily lean across and pull it between my teeth. Fuck, I'm just as bad as she is and I'm not even drunk. Maybe a little high, but not drunk. She would be so mad if she'd found me upstairs. I didn't actually smoke, but I was in the room and they were making it a point to blow it in my face. I pull her through the crowd and lead her into the least crowded room downstairs, which happens to the kitchen. Tessa leans her elbows on the island and looks up at me. How's it that she looks just as beautiful as she did when we left the apartment? All the other girls here look dreadful by now. After the first drink, their makeup begins to smear, their hair begins to tangle, and they look sloppy. Not Tessa. Tessa looks like a fucking goddess compared to them. Compared to anyone. I want another drink, Hardin, she says, but when I shake my head, she sticks her tongue out of her mouth like a child. Please. I'm having fun, don't be a party pooper. Fine, one more, but you have to stop talking like a 10-year-old, I tease her. Okay, sir. I most sincerely apologize for my immature language. I will not repeat said indiscretion, or an old man, I say with a laugh. But you can call me sir again. Fuck, well, okay, then. I'll fucking stop fucking talking like a motherfucking. But she doesn't finish her foul sentence, because she and I are both laughing too hard. You're insane tonight, I tell her. She giggles. I know, it's fun. I'm glad she's having fun, but I can't help the annoyance that I feel at her having had fun with said, not me. I'm going to keep my mouth shut, though, because I don't want to ruin her night. She stands, taking a sip from her drink. Let's go find Steph. You okay with her now? I ask as I follow her. I don't know how I feel about that. Good. I suppose I think so. There they are. She points to Tristan and Steph sitting on the couch. As we walk into the living room, a small cluster of guys sitting on the floor turns to look at Tessa. She's oblivious to their lustful stares, but I'm not. I shoot them a warning glare, and almost all of them turn away except a blonde who slightly resembles Noah. He continues to stare as we walk by. I debate whether kicking him in the face would be a good idea or not. But I choose to take Tessa's hand in mine instead, for now at least. Her head snaps back to look down at her joined hands, and her eyes are wide. Why is she so surprised? I mean, yeah, hand-holding isn't something I feel comfortable doing usually, but I do it on occasion, don't I? There you two are. Steph calls as we approach. Molly is sitting on the floor next to a guy I recognize. I'm pretty sure he's a junior, and his father owns some land in Vancouver, making him a trust fund brat. The two of them look fucking stupid together, but I'm just glad she's leaving me alone for now. She's so damn annoying, and Tessa hates her. We were outside, I tell her. I'm bored, Nate says, 
stirring his finger through his beer. I sit down at the end of the couch and pull Tessa onto my lap. Eyes dart to us, but I don't give a shit. I dare someone to say something about it. Within seconds, they all look away, except Steph, who stares a little too long before smiling. I don't return it, but I don't flip her off either, which is progress, right? We should play truth or dare, a voice suggests, and it takes a second to realize who the voice came from. What the hell? I lean my head up to look at Tessa, who is still seated on my lap. Sure, like you want to play, Molly mocks her. Why would you suggest that? You hate those games, I say quietly. She smirks. I don't know, I think it could be fun tonight. I follow her eyes to Molly, and I don't even want to know what is stirring in that pretty head of Tessa's. Chapter 59. Harden. Right as I whisper to Tessa, I don't know, if that's such a good idea, she turns around in my lap, and puts her index finger over my lips to silence me. Molly pipes up with a sly smile, What's wrong, Hardin? Afraid of a little dare, or is it the truth that you fear? What a fucking cunt. I'm about to reply, but I'm taken aback when Tessa growls, you the one that should be afraid. Molly raises one brow. Really? Okay okay calm down, you too, Nate says. As much as I'm enjoying watching Tessa put Molly in her place, I don't want Molly to take it too far. Tessa is a lot more fragile and sensitive than she is and Molly will say anything she can to hurt Tessa. Who goes first? Tristan asks. Tessa's hand shoots up immediately. Me. Oh lord, this is going to be a fucking disaster. I think that maybe I should go first, Steph interjects. Tessa sighs but sits silently, bringing her cup to her lips. Her lips are reddish from the cherry drink, and for a moment I'm lost in thoughts of them being wrapped around me, Harden, truth or dare. Steph breaks me from my perverted thoughts. Not playing, I say and try to go back to my fantasy. Why not, she asks. The spell broken, I look at her and groan. A, I don't want to. B, I've played more than enough lame ass games. Isn't that the truth, Molly mutters. That isn't what he meant, back off, Tristan says to defend me. Why did I ever fuck Molly, again? She's hot and was decent at giving blowjobs but she's so damn annoying. The memory of her touching me makes me nauseous, and I give Steph a keep it moving hand motion in order to redirect my mind. Okay, Nate. Truth or dare? Steph asks. Dare, he answers. Who Steph points to a tall girl wearing bright red lipstick. I dare you to go kiss that blonde in the blue shirt. Looking over, he whines, can't I kiss her friend instead? We all look at the girl next to the blonde, who has long curly hair and deep brown skin. She's much prettier than the blonde, so for Nate's sake I hope Steph allows the change. But instead she laughs and says with authority, nope, blondie it is. You are evil. He groans, and everyone laughs as he walks toward the girl. As Nate walks back with red lipstick stains around his lips, I now get why Tessa usually despises these games. Daring one another to do stupid things like this is just pointless. I never minded before, but then again I've never wanted to kiss one person only. I never want to kiss anyone except Tessa ever again. When Nate dares Tristan to drink a cup of beer that people have been using for an ashtray, I zone out. I take a lock of Tessa's soft hair between my fingers, slowly twisting it around. She covers her face with her hands as Tristan gags and Steph shrieks. After a few more mindless stares, it's finally Tessa's turn. Dare, she bravely says to Ned. I glare at him, warning him that, if he dares her to do anything inappropriate, I will not hesitate to jump across the table and choke him. He's a pretty cool and chill guy, so I didn't really think he would go too far, but I wanted to warn him anyway. I dare you to take a shot, he says. Lame, Molly chimes in. Tessa ignores her and downs the shot. She's already wasted, if he has much more, she'll be getting sick. Molly, truth or dare? Tessa says, her voice much too smug. Everyone tenses. Steph looks at me questioningly. Molly's eyes meet Tessa's, clearly surprised at Tessa's bold move. Truth or dare? Tess repeats. Truth, Molly answers. Is it true Tessa begins and leans forward that you're a whore? 
Gasps and chuckles fill the area. I bury my face in Tess's back to muffle my laughs. Jesus, this girl is nuts when she's drunk. Excuse me? Molly retorts, mouth agape. You heard me is it true that you're a whore? No, Molly says, her eyes now small slits. Nate is still laughing, Steph looks amused yet worried, and Tessa looks like she's ready to pounce on Molly. It's called truth for a reason, Tess eggs her on. I gently squeeze her thigh and whisper to her to let it go. I don't want Molly to hurt her, because then I'll have to hurt Molly. My turn, Molly says. Tessa, truth or dare, she asks. Here we go. Dare. Tessa smiles sadistically. Molly fakes surprise, then sneers, I dare you to kiss said. I look up quickly at Molly's terrible face. Fuck no, I say loudly. Everyone but her seems to shrink back a little. Why not? Molly smirks. It's familiar territory, she's done it before. I sit up more, pulling Tessa against me as I move both of us. Not fucking happening, I growl at the little whore. I don't give a shit about this stupid ass game, she isn't kissing anyone. Zed's eyes are focused on the wall, and when Molly looks over at him, she sees she has no support there. Fine, let's do truth then, she says. Is it true? that you're a dumb ass for. Getting back with Hardin, after he admitted he fucked you for a bet, she asks in a cheery voice. Tessa's body goes rigid on my lap. No, that's not true, she says, her voice small. Molly stands up. No, no, this is truth or dare, not little girl make believe. It is the truth, and you are a dumb ass for it. You believe anything that comes out of his mouth. Not that I blame you, because I know all of the amazing things that mouth can do. Man, that tongue, before I can stop her, Tessa is off of my lap and lunging toward Molly. Their bodies collide, Tessa pushing her back by her shoulders and grabbing onto them as they both fall back over Ed. Luckily for Molly, some other random kid breaks her fall. Unluckily for her, Tessa moves her hands from Molly's shoulders and grabs her hair. You fucking bitch. Tessa screams holding Molly's bright hair in her fists. She lifts Molly's head off of the carpet before slamming it back down. Molly yells and kicks her feet under Tessa's body, but Tessa has the advantage and Molly can't seem to gain any control over the situation. Molly's nails claw at Tessa's arms, but Tessa grabs her wrists and slams them down to her sides before raising a hand and slapping her across her face. Holy shit. I jump off of the couch and hook my arm around Tessa's waist, yanking her off. I never in a million years thought I would be breaking up a fight between Tess and anyone, let alone Molly, who's all talk. Tessa's body thrashes in my arms for a few seconds, before she calms slightly, and I'm able to drag her out of the living room. I tug at the ends of her dress to make sure it isn't hitched up, the last thing we need is for me to have to get into a fight too. There are only a few people in the kitchen, and already they're talking about the fight in the living room. I will fucking kill her, Hardin. I swear, she yells, moving out of my grip. I know I know you will, I say, but I can't take her seriously, despite witnessing her savagery firsthand. Stop smirking at me, she huffs, out of breath. Her eyes are white and shining, and her cheeks are red with anger. I'm not. I'm just really surprised at what happened. I bite down on my lip. I hate her so much. Like, who the hell does she think she is? She shouts and bobs her head toward the others in the room, obviously trying to get Molly's attention. All right, Ortiz, let's get you some water, I say. Ortiz, she asks. He's a UFC fighter, UFC? Never mind. I laugh and fill a glass of water for her. I check back in the living room to make sure Molly is nowhere to be found. My adrenaline is rushing like crazy, Tessa tells me. The best part of fighting is the high from the adrenaline. It's addicting. Have you ever been in a fight before? I ask, even though I'm sure I know the answer. No, of course not. Why did you get into one just now? Who cares what Molly thinks about us being together? It's not that. That's not what made me mad. What was it, then? I ask her. She hands me the empty cup of water and I refill it. When she said that about you and her, she admits, her face twisted in anger. Oh. Yeah. I should have punched her, 
She huffs out. Yes, but I think knocking her to the ground and slamming her head against the floor worked pretty well too, Ortiz. A small smile breaks from her lips, and she giggles. I can't believe I just did that. She giggles again. You are so drunk. I laugh. I am, she agrees loudly. Drunk enough to slam Molly's head against the floor, she says, laughing again. I think everyone enjoyed the show, I tell her, snaking my arm around her waist. I hope no one is mad at me for causing a scene. There's my. Tessa. Drunk as shit, yet still trying to be considerate of other people. No one is mad, baby. If anything, they'll be thanking you. This is the kind of shit these frat kids live for, I assure her. God, I hope not, she says and looks momentarily grossed out. Don't worry about it. Do you want to go find Steph? I ask to distract her. Or we could do something else she says, hooking her fingers into the top of my jeans. You are never drinking vodka when I'm not around, I tell her, teasing but so serious. Sure now let's go upstairs. She leans up and plants a kiss on my jaw. You're a bossy little thing, aren't you? I smile. You are the only one who gets to be bossy all the time. She laughs and grips the collar of my shirt, pulling me down to her height. At least let me do something for you, she purrs, nipping at my earlobe. You just got in a fight, your first fight, at that, and this is what you're thinking? She nods. Then she says in a low, slow voice that makes my pants feel even tighter, you know you want to, harden. Okay fuck okay. I give in. Well, that was easy. I grab her wrist, and lead her upstairs. Has someone already taken over your old room? She asks when we reach the second floor. Yeah, but there are plenty of empty rooms, I tell her, and open the door to one of them. The two small beds are covered with black comforters, and there are shoes in the closet. I don't know whose room this is, but it's ours now. I lock the door and take a few steps to meet Tessa. Unzip me, she commands. Not wasting any time, I see, shut up and unzip my dress she snaps. I shake my head in amusement, and she turns around and lifts her hair. My lips brush over the nape of her neck as I slide the zipper down her back. Goosebumps appear on her soft skin, and I follow them down her spine with my index finger. Shivering a little, she turns around, sliding down the sleeves of her dress. The whole thing drops to her feet, revealing the hot pink lace bra and panties that I absolutely fucking love. I can tell by the smile on her face that she knows this. Leave your shoes on, I practically beg. She agrees with a smile and looks down at her shoes. I want to do something for you first. In a swift motion, she tugs at my jeans, but frowns when they don't move. Her fingers quickly unbutton the fly front, and she pulls them down. I step backward toward the bed, but she stops me. No, you. Who knows who has done what on that thing? She makes a disgusted face. Floor, she demands. I guarantee that floor is much dirtier than the bed, I say. Here, let me put my shirt down. I pull my shirt over my head and lay it on the floor, then sit down on top of it. Tessa joins me, straddling me. Her mouth latches onto the skin on my neck, and she rolls her hips, pushing herself against me. Fuck. Tess, I breathe. I'm going to finish before you start, if you keep doing that. She removes her lips from my neck. What do you want me to do, Harden? Do you want to fuck me, or do you want me to be L? I cut her off with a kiss. I'm not wasting any time with foreplay. I want her, I need her, now. Within seconds, her panties lie on the floor next to her, and I'm reaching for my jeans to grab a condom. I need to remind her about getting on birth control. I can't stand using a condom with her. I want to feel her, all of her. Harden hurry up, she begs and lies back on the floor, using her elbows to prop herself up, long hair trailing onto the floor behind her. I crawl over to her, separate her thighs even farther with my knees, and move to slide into her. She loses balance on her elbows and falls back to the floor, grabbing onto my arms for leverage. No I want to do it, she says pushing me onto the floor and climbing on top of me. She whines as she lowers herself onto me, and it's the most delicious sound. Her hips roll slowly, circling, bouncing, torturing me. She covers her mouth with her hand, 
and her eyes roll back. When she rakes her nails down my stomach, I nearly lose it. I wrap my arm around her back and flip us over. I've had enough of her being in control, I can't handle it. What, she begins. I'm the one in charge, the one with the control. Don't forget that, baby, I groan and slam into her roughly, moving in and out at a much faster pace than she was torturing me with. She nods feverishly and covers her mouth again. When we get home I'll fuck you again, and you won't be covering your mouth I threaten, bringing her leg up to my shoulder. Everyone will be able to hear you. Hear what I'm doing to you, what only I can do to you. She moans again, and I place a kiss on her calf as she stiffens. I am close too close, and I bury my head in her neck as I fill the condom. I rest my head on her chest until our breathing returns to normal. That was she breathes. Better than attacking Molly? I laugh. I don't know at least a close second, she teases and stands to get dressed. Chapter 60. Tessa. Hardin helps me sip, up and I rake my fingers through my hair, while he buttons his jeans. What time is it? I ask as he slides his shoes back on. Two minutes till midnight, he answers, after looking at the alarm clock on the small desk. Oh well, we need to hurry and get downstairs, I tell him. I'm still beyond intoxicated, but now I'm relaxed and calm, thanks to Hardin. Drunk or not, I can't believe what happened with Molly. Let's go. He takes my hand, and we nearly make it to the staircase, before everyone begins chanting. 1098 Hardin rolls his eyes. 76 This is stupid, Hardin complains. 543 I begin chanting. Do it with me, I say. He tries not to smile but is defeated as a huge grin spreads across his face. 2-1 I poke his cheek with my finger. Happy New Year, everyone screams, including me. Yay for the New Year, Hardin says in a monotone voice, and I laugh as he presses his lips to mine. Part of me was worried that he wouldn't kiss me here, in front of everyone, but he is now. As my hands travel to his waist he grabs them to stop me. When he pulls away, his emerald eyes are shining. He is so beautiful. Aren't you worn out, he jokes, and I shake my head. Don't flatter yourself. I wasn't coming on to you. I smile. I really need to pee. Do you want me to come? Nope. Be right back, I say, giving him a small kiss, before walking to the bathroom. I should have had him come along. This is much more difficult than it is when I'm sober. Tonight has been so fun, even with the Molly drama. Hardin has surprised me by being calm, even with said, and he's remained in a good mood all night. After I wash my hands, I head back down the hall to find Hardin. Hardin, a female voice calls. I look over and see a familiar face, the girl with the black hair who bumped into me earlier. And she's walking toward Hardin. Being the nosy girl that I am, I stay back a few feet. I have your phone, you left it in Logan's room. She smiles pulling Hardin's phone from her purse. What? It's nothing, I'm sure. They were in Logan's room, which means most likely they were not alone. I trust him. Thanks. He grabs the phone from her, and she begins to walk away. Thank God. Hey, he calls after her. Can you do me a favor, and maybe not mention to anyone, that we were in Logan's room together, he asks. I never kiss and tell. She grins and walks off. The hallway begins to spin. My chest immediately aches, and I quickly head for the stairs. Hardin notices me rushing by, and I watch as the color drains from his face, knowing he's been caught. Chapter 61. Hardin. I notice a flicker of gold a few feet away. I look past Jamie and see Tessa, whose eyes are wide, and whose bottom lip starts trembling. She goes from deer in headlights to angry girlfriend quickly, and takes off down the stairs fast. What? Tessa. Wait. I yell after her. For someone as drunk as she is, she's really flying down those steps. Why must she always run from me? Tess. I shout again, pushing people out of my way. Finally, when I'm only a few feet from her in the entryway, she does something that nearly brings me to my knees. The blonde asshole who was checking her out earlier whistles as she rushes by. As she stops in her tracks, her look makes me freeze too. Grinning, she grabs a handful of the kid's shirt. What the fuck is she doing? 
Is she going to? She answers my thoughts by looking back at me before pressing her lips against his. I blink rapidly in an attempt to make this disappear. This isn't happening. She wouldn't do that, not Tessa, no matter how pissed off she is. The kid, surprised by her sudden show of affection, quickly recovers and wraps his arms around her waist. Her mouth opens, and she moves one hand to his hair, tugging on it. I can't comprehend what's actually happening right now. Harden. Stop, she screams. Stop what? When I blink again, I'm on top of the blonde, and his lip is busted. I hit him already? Please, Harden, she screams again. I climb off of him in a hurry, before everyone crowds around us. What the fuck, the kid groans. I want to kick him in his fucking head, but I've been trying to restrain myself. She had to go, and fucking do this, mess up everything I've been working toward. I head for the door without bothering to see if she's following me. Why did you hit him? Her voice calls from behind me as I reach my car. Why do you think, Tessa? Maybe because I just watched you fucking make out with him. I scream. I almost forgot what it feels like, this adrenaline rush and the familiar sting on my knuckles. I only got one hit and I think, at least so it's not so bad. But I want more. She begins to cry. Why do you care? You kissed that girl. Probably more than kissed. How could you? No. You don't get to fucking cry, Tessa. You just kissed someone right in front of me. My hand connects with the hood of my car. You did worse. I heard you tell that girl to stay quiet about you two in Logan's room. You don't even know what you're talking about. I didn't fucking kiss anyone. Yes, you did. She said she doesn't kiss and tell. She screams, waving her arms around like an idiot. Fuck, she's infuriating. It's a fucking figure of speech, Tessa. She meant she wasn't going to tell anyone anything that we talked about or that we were smoking pot. I shout. She gasps. You were smoking pot? No, I wasn't, actually, but who gives a shit? You just fucking cheated on me. I tug at my own hair. Why did you leave me to hang out with her, then tell her not to say anything? It doesn't make any, she's Dan's sister. I was telling her not to say anything. Because I was trying to apologize privately for what I did to her. I was going to tell you tomorrow, when you weren't fucking belligerent. We were all in the room, me, her, Logan, and Nate. They were smoking a joint, and when they left I asked her to stay behind, because I wanted to try to make shit right with her, for you. All my anger comes out through my eyes, I'm certain, when I say, I wouldn't fucking cheat on you, you should know that. And like that, Tessa deflates. She's speechless. Damn right she is. She's fucking wrong, and I am fucking mad. Well she begins. Well what? You're wrong, not me. You didn't give me a chance to explain myself. Instead you acted like a child. An impulsive little child. I scream, punching the hood again. She jumps from the noise, but I don't give a shit. I should just go back inside, find the blonde guy, and finish what I started. Punching my car doesn't give me the same satisfaction. I'm not a child. I thought you did something with her, she shouts back at me through her tears. Well, I didn't. After everything I went through to get you to stay with me, do you think I'd cheat on you with a random chick at a party or hell, with anyone? I didn't know what to think. She throws her hands into the air again. I run my fingers through my hair, trying to calm myself. Well, that's on you, then. I don't know what the hell else to do to make you see that I love you. She kissed someone, she kissed another guy right in front of me. This feels worse than when she left me, at least I could blame myself then. Her warm breath is creating puffs of smoke in the cold air. Well, maybe if I wasn't so used to you keeping secrets, I wouldn't have been so ready to misunderstand, she yells. I look at her. You're unbelievable. I honestly cannot even look at you right now. The image of her kissing him won't stop playing over and over. I'm sorry for kissing him. She sighs. It isn't that big of a deal. You're joking, right? Please tell me that you are, because if that had been me kissing someone else, you probably wouldn't have spoken to me again. But I forgot that since it's Princess Tessa, it's okay. No harm done. I mock. 
She crosses her arms with an indignation she doesn't deserve. Princess Tessa? Really, Hardin? Yeah, really? You cheated on me, right in front of me. I brought you here, so you would know how much I care about you. I wanted you to know that I don't care what anyone thinks about us. I wanted you to have the best night you could have, and then you go, and do this shit. Hardin I know. I'm not un. I pull out my keys. You're acting as if this is no big deal. This is a huge deal to me. To see another man's lips on yours is I can't even explain how sick that makes me. I said, I lose it. I know I look wild and scary, but I can't help it. Stop interrupting me for once in your goddamn life. I shout. You know what it's fine. You can go back in there and ask your new boyfriend to give you a ride home. I turn and unlock the car door. He looks a lot like Noah, and you probably miss him. What? What does Noah have to do with this? And I clearly do not have a type, she growls and gestures at me. Though maybe I should. Fuck this, I spit and climb into the car, turning it on, and leaving her standing out in the cold. When I get to the stop sign, I can't help, but hit the steering wheel over and over. If she doesn't call me within an hour, I'll know she went home with someone else. Chapter 62. Tessa. Ten minutes later I'm still standing on the sidewalk. My legs and arms are numb, and I'm shivering. Hardin will come back any minute, there's no way he'll actually leave me here, alone. Drunk and alone. When I go to call him, I remember that he has my phone. Great. What the hell was I thinking? I wasn't thinking, that's the problem. We were doing so good, and I didn't even try to give him the benefit of the doubt. Instead I kissed someone. The memory makes me want to vomit on the sidewalk. Why hasn't he come back yet? I need to go inside. It's way too cold out here, and I want another drink. My buzz is starting to wear off, and I'm not ready to face reality. When I get inside, I head directly for the kitchen, and pour myself a drink. This is why I shouldn't drink, I have no common sense when I'm drunk. I immediately assume the worst of him, and made a huge mistake. Tessa? Zed's voice says from behind me. Hey. I groan and lift my head up from the cool counter and turn to face him. Um what are you doing? He half laughs. Are you okay? Yeah I'm okay, I lie. Where's Hardin? He left. He left? Without you? Yep. I take a drink from my cup. Why? Because I'm an idiot, I answer honestly. I doubt that. He smiles. No, really, I am this time. Do you want to talk about it? No, not really. I sigh. Okay well, I'll leave you alone, he says and begins to walk away. But then he turns back around. It's not supposed to be so complicated, you know? What? I ask him, and follow him to sit at a card table in the kitchen. Love, relationships, all that. It doesn't have to be so hard. Doesn't it, though? Isn't it always like this? I have no reference except Noah. We never fought like this, but I don't know that I loved him. Not like I do Hardin. I dump my drink down the sink and grab a glass to fill with water. I don't think so. I've never seen anyone fight the way you two do. It's because we're so different, that's all. Yeah, I guess you are. He smiles. By the time I check the clock again, it's been an hour since Hardin left me here. Maybe he isn't coming back after all. Would you forgive someone, if they kissed someone else? I finally ask Zed. I guess it depends on the details. What if they did it right in front of you? Hell, no. That's unforgivable, he says with a disgusted expression. Oh. Zed leans toward me sympathetically. He did that? No. I look up at him with wide eyes. I did. You did? Zed is clearly surprised. Yeah I told you I'm an idiot. Yeah, I hate to say it, but you are. Yep, I agree. How are you getting home, he asks. Well, I keep thinking he's going to come back to get me, but he's obviously not going to. I bite my lip. I can take you if you want, he says. But when I look around uncertainly, he adds, or Steph and Tristan are probably upstairs you know. I look at him quickly. Actually, can you take me now? I don't want to dig myself in any deeper, but I'm beginning to sober up, thank goodness, 
and I just want to be home to try to talk to Hardin. Yeah, let's go, said says, and I down the last of my water, before following him outside to his car. When we're only about 10 minutes away from the apartment, I begin panicking over Hardin's reaction to Zed driving me home. I keep trying to force myself to sober up, but it doesn't work that way. I'm a lot less intoxicated than I was an hour ago, but I'm still drunk. Can I use your phone to try to call him? I ask Zed. He removes one hand from the steering wheel to dig into his pocket for his phone. Here shit, it's dead, he says, pressing the button on the top and revealing an empty battery symbol. Thanks anyway. I shrug. Calling Hardin from Zed's phone probably isn't the best idea I've had. Not as bad as my idea to kiss a random guy in front of Hardin, but still not a good one. What if he isn't here? I say. Zed looks at me quizzically. You have a key, don't you? I didn't bring mine I didn't think I would need it. Oh well I'm sure he'll be here, Zed says, but he sounds nervous. Hardin would literally murder him if he found me at Zed's place. When we do arrive at the apartment, Zed parks and I scan the parking lot for Hardin's car. And it's parked in his usual spot, thank God. I have no idea what I would have done if you weren't here. Zed insists on walking me up. As much as I think that will not end well, I don't know if I'm capable of getting myself up to the apartment alone in my intoxicated state. Damn Hardin for leaving me at that party. Damn me for being an impulsive idiot. Damn Zed for being so sweet and fearless when he shouldn't be. Damn Washington for being so damn cold. When we reach the elevator, my head begins to pound along with my heart. I need to go over what I'm going to say to Hardin. He'll be so mad at me, and I need to think of a good way to apologize without using sex. I'm not used to being the one to apologize for anything, because he's always the one who messes up. Being on the side of things doesn't feel good at all. It feels terrible. We walk down the hallway, and I can't help but feel as if we're preparing to walk the plank. I just don't know whether it will be Zed or myself that drops down into the water. I knock, and Zed stands a few feet behind me as we wait for the door to open. This was a terrible idea, I should have just stayed at the party. I knock again, this time louder. What if he doesn't answer? What if he took my car and isn't even here? I didn't think of that. If he doesn't answer, can I go to your place? I try to hold my tears back. I don't want to stay at Zed's and make Hardin even more upset with me, but I can't really think of another option. What if he doesn't forgive me? I can't be without him. Zed's hand touches my back, and he rubs up and down to soothe me. I cannot cry, I need to be calm, when he answers if he answers. Of course you can, Zed finally replies. Hardin. Please open up, I quietly beg, and rest my forehead against the door. I don't want to yell, and cause a scene at nearly 2 in the morning. Our neighbors probably have issues with us yelling enough already. I guess he's not going to answer. I sigh and lean up against the wall for a minute. Then, finally, as we turn to walk away, the door clicks open. Well look who decided to show up, Hardin says as he stands in the doorway and eyes us. Something about his tone sends chills down my spine. When I turn to face him, his eyes are bloodshot and his cheeks are pink. Zed. Pal. It's so nice to see you, he slurs. He's drunk. My thoughts suddenly clear. Hardin have you been drinking? He looks at me imperiously, clearly unsteady. What's it to you? You have a new boyfriend. Hardin I don't know what to say to him. He's obviously wasted. The last time I saw him this drunk was the night Landon called me to come to Ken's house. With his father's history of drinking, and the way Trish was so fearful, that Hardin had began to drink again, my heart sinks. Thank you for bringing me home, I think you should go now, I politely say to Zed. Hardin is too drunk to be around Zed. New ho ho Hardin exhales. Come on in. Let's have a drink together. He grabs Zed's arm, and pulls him through the doorway. I follow them in, protesting, no, this is not a good idea. You're drunk. It's fine, Zed tells me, waving me off. It's almost like he has a death wish. Hardin stumbles over to the coffee table, grabs the bottle of dark liquor standing on it, and pours the liquid into a glass. 
Yeah, Tessa. Chill the fuck out. I want to yell at him for speaking to me that way, but I can't find my voice. Here you go, I'll get another one. One for you too, Tess, Hardin mumbles and walks into the kitchen. Zed sits in the chair, and I take a seat on the couch. I'm not leaving you here alone with him. Look how drunk he is, he whispers. I thought he didn't drink. He doesn't not like this. This is my fault. I put my head in my hands. I hate that Hardin is drunk, because of what I did. I wanted us to have a civil conversation, so I could apologize for everything. No, it's not, Zed assures me. This one's for you, Hardin says loudly as he bursts back into the room and hands me a glass half full of liquor. I don't want any more. I drank enough tonight. I take the glass from his hands and set it on the table. Suit yourself, more for me. He smiles at me something evil, not the same as the smile I've grown to adore. I'm honestly a little frightened. I know Harding would never hurt me physically, but I don't like this side of him. I would rather him be screaming at me, or punching a wall than sitting here drunk off his ass, and being so calm. Too calm. Zed gives a little cheers, and brings his drink to his lips. This is just like old times, isn't it? Do you know, back before you wanted to fuck my girl, Hardin says, and Zed spits his drink back into the glass. It's not like that. You left her there, and I just brought her home, Zed says in a threatening tone. Hardin waves his own drink in the air. I'm not just talking about tonight, and you know it. Though I am pretty annoyed by you taking it upon yourself to bring her home. She's a big girl, she can fend for herself. She shouldn't have to fend for herself, said fires back. Hardin slams his glass onto the table, and I jump. That's not up to you. You wish it was, though, don't you? I feel like I'm in the middle of a gunfight, and I want to move, but my body won't allow it. I watch in horror as my Mr. Darcy begins to transform into Tom Buchanan. No, said responds. Hardin sits down next to me, but keeps his glassy eyes focused on Zed. I look down at the bottle, which is at least a fourth gone. I pray that Hardin has not consumed all of it tonight, within the last hour and a half. Yeah, it is. I'm not stupid. You want her. Molly told me everything you said before. Leave it alone, Hardin, said Growls, only egging Hardin on. Your first problem is talking to Molly. Oh, Tessa is so beautiful, Tessa is so sweet. Tessa is too good for Hardin. Tessa should be with me. Hardin mocks. What? Zed avoids looking at me. Shut the fuck up, Hardin. Hear that, babe? Zed thought he could actually have you. Hardin laughs. Stop it, Hardin, I say and get up from the couch. Zed looks humiliated. I shouldn't have asked him to drive me home. Did he really say those things about me? I had assumed the way he acted toward me had to do with shame over the bet, but now I'm not so sure. Look at her, I bet you're thinking about it right now aren't you? Hardin taunts him. Zed glares at Hardin and sets his drink on the table. You will never have her, kid, so give it up. No one will have her except me, I'm the only one who will ever fuck her. The only one who will know how good it feels to have her, stop it. I yell. What the hell is wrong with you? Nothing, I'm just telling him how it is, Hardin answers. You're being cruel, I tell him and disrespectful to me. I turn to Zed. I really think you should go. Zed looks at Hardin, then back to me. I'm fine, I assure him. I don't know what will happen, but I know it won't be as bad as what will occur if he stays. Please, I beg. Finally Zed nods. Fine, I'll go. He needs to get his shit together. Both of you do. You heard her, get the fuck out. Don't be too sad, though, she doesn't want me either. Hardin takes another drink. She likes those clean-cut pretty boys. My heart sinks even lower, and I know I'm in for a long night. I don't know if I should be afraid, but I'm not. Well a little, but I'm not leaving. Out, Hardin repeats, pointing, and Zed heads for the door. Once Zed is no longer in the apartment, Hardin locks the door and turns to face me. You're lucky I didn't beat his ass for bringing you here. You know that, don't you? Yes, I agree. Arguing with him doesn't seem like a good idea. Why did you even come here? I live here. Not for long. 
He pours more alcohol. What? The air leaves my lungs. You're going to kick me out? When the glass is full, he cocks one eye at me. No, you'll leave on your own eventually. No, I won't. Maybe your new lover has room at his place. The two of you looked really nice together. The hateful way he's speaking to me takes me back to the beginning of our relationship, and I don't like it. Harden, please stop saying those things. I don't even know him. And I'm incredibly sorry for what I did. I will say what I want, just the way you do, whatever the fuck you want. I made a mistake, and I'm sorry, but that doesn't give you the right to treat me so cruelly and drink like this. I was so drunk, and I really thought something happened with you and that girl, I didn't know what to think. I'm so sorry, I'd never hurt you purposely. I say it all as fast as I can, with as much emphasis as possible, but he isn't listening. You are still talking, he snaps. I sigh and chew on my cheek. Don't cry. Don't cry. I'm going to go to bed, and we can talk when you aren't so drunk. He doesn't say anything, he doesn't even look at me, so I take off my shoes and walk into the bedroom. As soon as I go to close the door, I hear glass shatter. When I rush into the living room, the wall is wet, and glass litters the floor. I watch helplessly as he grabs the other two glasses and slams them against the wall. He takes one last swig from the bottle, and then uses all of his strength to shatter it against the wall. Chapter 63. Tessa. He grabs the lamp off the table, causing the cord to rip out of the wall, before smashing it on the floor. Then he grabs a vase, and breaks it against the brick. Why is his first instinct to break everything in sight? Stop it. I scream. Harden, you're going to break all of our stuff? Please stop it. This is your fault, Tessa. You fucking caused this, he shouts back, and grabs another vase. I scurry into the living room, and snatch the object from his hand, before he can break it. I know it is. Please just talk to me, I beg. I can't hold my tears back any longer. Please, Harden. You fucked up, Tessa, so badly. His fist slams against the wall. I knew this was coming, and honestly, I'm surprised it took this long. I'm thankful he chose the drywall to hit, the brick surely would have damaged his hand much worse. Just leave me alone, damn it. Go away. He paces back and forth before slamming both palms against the wall. I love you I blurt. I need to try to calm him, but he's just so drunk and intimidating. Well, you don't act like it. You kissed another fucking guy. Then you bring Zed to my fucking house. My heart lurches at the mention of Zed's name. Harden humiliated him. I know I'm sorry. I fight the urge to call him out for being a hypocrite. Yes, I know what I did was wrong, so wrong but I have forgiven him for hurting me repeatedly. Do you know how fucking crazy, how absolutely fucking mad it makes me to see you with anyone else, and you go and do this shit. The veins in his neck are turning a deep purple, and he's beginning to resemble a monster. I said I'm sorry Harden. I speak as softly and slowly as I can manage. What more can I say? I wasn't thinking clearly. He tugs at his hair. Sorry doesn't erase the image from my mind. It's all I can see. I walk toward him and stand directly in front of him. He reeks of whiskey. Then look at me, look at me. I put my hands on his face, directing his gaze. You kissed him, you kissed someone else. His voice is much lower than it was seconds ago. I know I did, and I'm so sorry Harden. I wasn't thinking. You know how irrational I can be. That's not an excuse. I know, baby, I know. I'm hoping those words will soften him. It hurts, he says, though his bloodshot eyes have lost their edge. I knew better than to have a girlfriend, not that I ever wanted one, but this is what happens when people date or get married. This type of shit is why I need to be alone. I don't want to go through this. He pulls away from me. My chest aches, because he sounds like a child, a lonely sad child. I can't help, but picture Hardin as a child, hiding away as his parents fight over his father's alcohol abuse. Hardin, please forgive me. It won't happen again, I will never do anything like this again. It doesn't matter, Tess, one of us will. That's what people do when they love each other. They hurt each other, then break up or get divorced. 
I don't want that for us, for you. I step closer to him. That won't happen with us. We're different. He shakes his head lightly. It happens with everyone. Look at our parents. Our parents just married the wrong people, that's all. Look at Karen and your dad. I'm relieved that he's being much calmer now. They'll get divorced too. No Harden. I don't think they will. I do. Marriage is such a fucked up concept. Hey, I sort of like you, so let's move in together and sign some paperwork promising to never leave each other, even though we won't stick to it anyway. Why would anyone do that willingly? Why would you want to be tied down to one person forever? I'm not mentally prepared to process what he's just said to me. He doesn't see a future with me. He's only saying this because he's drunk. Right? Do you really want me to go? Is that what you want, to end this now? I ask, looking straight into his eyes. He doesn't answer me. Harden? No fuck no Tessa. I love you. I love you so fucking much, but you what you did was so wrong. You took every single fear that I have and brought them to life in one action. His eyes begin to water and my chest begins to cave in. I know I did. I feel terrible for hurting you. He looks around the room and I can see in his eyes that everything we've built here was him trying to prove himself to me. You should be with someone like Noah, he says. I don't want to be with anyone except you. I wipe my eyes. I'm afraid you will. Afraid I'll what? Leave you for Noah? Not him exactly, but someone like him. I won't. Harden, I love you. No one else, I love you. I love everything about you, please stop doubting yourself. It hurts me to think that he feels this way. Can you honestly tell me? that you didn't start seeing me to piss off your mom? What? I say, but he just watches me and waits for an answer. No, of course not. My mother has nothing to do with us. I fell in love with you because well, because I didn't have a choice. I couldn't help it. I tried not to because of what my mother would think, but I never had a choice. I've always loved you, whether I wanted to or not. Sure. What can I do to make you see that? After everything I've been through for him, how could he think me being with him is a way to rebel against my mother? Not kiss other guys, perhaps. I know you're insecure, but you should know that I love you. I have fought for you from day one, with my mother, Noah, everyone. But something I've said strikes him wrong. Insecure? I'm not insecure. But I'm also not going to sit around and be played for a fucking fool. With his sudden turn back to anger, I'm starting to get angry myself. You are worried about being played? I know what I did was wrong, but he has done much worse to me. He really did treat me like a fool, and I forgave him. Don't start that shit with me, he growls. We've come such a long way, we've been through so much, Harden. Don't let one mistake take that from us. I never thought I'd be the one begging for forgiveness. You did it, not me. Stop being so cold to me. You've done a lot of things to me too, I snap. Anger returns to his face, and he storms away from me, yelling over his shoulder, you know what? I've done a lot of things, but you kissed someone right in front of me. Oh, you mean like the night you had Molly on your lap and kissed her in front of me? He spins around quickly. We weren't together then. Maybe not to you, but I thought we were. Doesn't fucking matter, Tessa. So you're saying that you aren't going to let this go, then? I don't know what I'm saying, but you are getting on my nerves. I think you should go to bed, I suggest. Despite the glimpses of understanding that have appeared in the last few minutes, it's clear that he has his mind set on being cruel. I think you shouldn't tell me what to do. I know you're angry and hurt, but you can't talk to me that way. It's not right, and I won't put up with it. Drunk or not. I am not hurt. He glares at me. Harden and his pride. You just said you were. No, I didn't, don't tell me what I said. Okay, okay. I throw my hands up, giving in. I'm exhausted, and I don't want to pull the pin on the grenade that is Harden. He walks over to the key rack and takes his keychain off while he stumbles to grab his boots. What are you doing? I rush over to him. Leaving, what does it look like? You aren't leaving. You have been drinking. A lot. I reach for his keys, but he slips them into his pocket. 
I don't give a shit, I need more to drink. No. You don't. You had enough, and you broke the bottle. I try to reach for his pocket, but he grabs a hold of my wrist like he has done countless times. This time is different, because he's so angry, and for a second I begin to worry. Let go, I challenge him. Don't try to stop me from leaving, and I'll let go. He doesn't let up, and I try to appear unaffected. Harden you're going to hurt me. His eyes meet mine, and he lets go quickly. When he raises a hand, I flinch and slink back away from him, but he's only running it through his hair, I see. His eyes flash with panic. Do you thought I was going to hit you? He nearly whispers, and I back away farther. I, I don't know, you're so angry, and you're scaring me. I knew he wouldn't hurt me, but this is the easiest way to get him back to reality. You should know I wouldn't hurt you. No matter how drunk I am, I wouldn't fucking touch you. He glares at me. For someone who hates your father so much, you sure as hell don't have a problem acting like him, I spit. Fuck you, I'm nothing like him, he shouts. Yes, you are. You're drunk, you left me at that party, and you broke half our decorations in the living room, including my favorite lamp. You are acting like him the old him. Yeah, well, you're acting like your mum. A spoiled snobby little, he sneers and I gasp. Who are you? I ask and shake my head. I walk away, not wanting to hear any more from him, and I know, if we continue to argue, while he's this drunk, it will not end well. He's taken his disrespect to a whole new level. Tessa I'm he begins. Don't. I turn and spit before continuing to the bedroom. I can take his rude comments, I can take him yelling at me because, hell, I dish it out right back to him but we both need distance before one of us says something even worse. I didn't mean that he says and follows me. I close the bedroom door and lock it behind me. I slide my back down its smooth surface until I'm sitting on the floor, my knees pulled up to my chest. Maybe we can't make this work. Maybe he's too angry and I'm too irrational. I push him too far and he does the same to me. No, that isn't true. We are good for each other because we push each other. Despite all the fights and tension between us, there's passion. So much passion, that it nearly drowns me, pulling me under. And he's the only light, the only one to save me regardless, of whether he's the one dooming me. Hardin taps the wood softly. Tess, open the door. Just go to sleep please, I cry. Damn it, Tessa. Open this door now. I'm sorry, okay? He shouts and begins to pound at the door. Praying that he won't bust through the door, I force myself up off the floor and pat over to the dresser to dig through my bottom drawer. When I see the white of the paper, relief washes over me, and I go into the closet and close myself in there. As I begin reading Hardin's note to me, the pounding at the door is drowned out to the point of no longer existing. The ache in my chest dissolves along with my headache. Nothing exists except this letter, these perfect words from my imperfect Hardin. I read it over and over until my tears stop along with the noise from the hall. I desperately hope that he didn't leave, but I'm not going out there to find out. My heart and my eyes are too heavy. I need to lie down. Taking the letter with me, I drag my body to the bed, still wearing my dress. Eventually sleep comes to me, and I am free to dream of the Hardin that scribbled these words on a sheet of paper in a hotel room. When I wake up in the middle of the night, I fold the letter up and place it back in my bottom drawer before opening the bedroom door. Hardin is asleep in the hallway, curled up in a ball on the concrete floor. Figuring I shouldn't wake him, I leave him alone to sleep off his intoxication and go back to sleep. Chapter 64 Tessa Come the morning, the hallway is empty and the mess in the living room is completely cleared. Not one single piece of glass is left on the floor. The room smells of lemons, and the whiskey is no longer splattered across the wall. I'm surprised Hardin even knew where the cleaner is stored. Hardin? I call, my voice hoarse from all the yelling I did last night. Getting no answer, I go over to the kitchen table, where an index card with his handwriting rests. Please don't leave, I'll be back soon, it says. The thousand pounds of pressure lifts from my chest, and I grab a ureter, make a cup of coffee, and wait for his return. 
What feels like hours go by before Hardin finally comes back home. I have since showered, cleaned up the kitchen, and read 50 pages of Moby Dick, and I don't even care for the book. Most of the time that has passed has been filled with me thinking of every possibility of his behavior and what he will say. The fact that he didn't want me to leave, so that is a good thing. Right? I sure hope so. The entire night is a blur, but I remember the key points. When I hear the click of the front door, I instantly still. Everything I've been preparing to say to him vanishes from my mind. I set the e-reader down on the table and sit up on the couch. When Hardin walks through the door, he's wearing a gray sweatshirt and his signature black jeans. He doesn't leave the house in anything except black and occasionally white, so the contrast today is a little strange, but the sweatshirt makes him look younger somehow. His hair is messy and pushed off his forehead, and his eyes have dark circles under them. In his hand is a lamp, different from the one he shattered last night, but very similar. Hey, he says and runs his tongue along his bottom lip, before pulling his lip ring between his teeth. Hi, I mutter in return. How how did you sleep, he asks. I stand up from the couch as he walks toward the kitchen. Good I lie. That's good. It is evident that we're both treading very lightly, afraid to say the wrong thing. He stands by the counter, and I stay near the fridge. I, um I got a new lamp. He nods at his purchase, before setting it on the counter. It's nice. I feel anxious, very anxious. They didn't have the one we had, but they, he begins. I'm so sorry, I blurt out, interrupting him. Me too, Tessa. Last night was not supposed to go that way, I say and look down. That is surely an understatement. It was a terrible night. I should have let you explain yourself before I kissed someone, it was stupid and immature of me. Yes, it was. I shouldn't have had to explain myself, you should have trusted me and not jumped to conclusions. He leans his elbows on the counter behind him and I fiddle with my fingers, trying not to pick at the skin around my fingernails. I know. I'm sorry. I heard you the first ten times, Tess. Are you going to forgive me? You were talking about kicking me out. I wasn't talking about kicking you out. He shrugs. I was just saying that relationships do not work. A big part of me was praying that he wouldn't remember the things he was saying last night. He basically told me that marriage is for fools and that he should be alone. What are you saying? Just that. Just that what? I thought I don't know what to say. I thought the new lamp was his way of apologizing and that he felt different this morning than he did last night. Do you thought what? That you didn't want me to leave because you wanted to talk about it when you got home. We are talking about it. A lump grows in my throat. So what, then, you don't want to be with me anymore. That isn't what I'm saying. Come here, he says, opening his arms. I stay silent as I cross our small kitchen and step closer to him. He grows impatient, and when I get close enough he pulls me to his chest, wrapping his arms around my waist. My head lies on his chest, the soft cotton of his sweatshirt is still cool from the cold winter air. I missed you so much, he says into my hair. I didn't go anywhere, I reply. He pulls me closer. Yes, you did. When you kissed that guy, I lost you momentarily, that was enough for me. I couldn't stand it, not even for a second. You didn't lose me, Hardin. I made a mistake. Please he begins to say, but corrects himself, don't do it again. I mean it. I won't, I assure him. You brought said here. Only because you left me at that party, and I needed a ride home, I remind him. We haven't looked at each other so far during this conversation, and I want to keep it that way. I am fearless well, slightly fearless without those green eyes piercing mine. You should have called, he says. I continue staring beyond him. You have my phone, and I waited outside. I thought you were coming back, I say. He lifts me gently from his chest and holds me back slightly so he can look at me. He looks so tired. I know that I do too. I may have handled my anger poorly, but I didn't know what else to do. The intensity of his gaze causes me to move my eyes from his and stare at the floor. Do you care for him? Hardin's voice is shaky when he lifts my chin to look at him. What? 
He can't be serious. Hardin answer me. Not the way you're assuming. What does that mean? Hardin is growing anxious, or angry, I can't tell. Maybe both. I care for him in a way, a friendly way. Nothing more? Hardin's tone is pleading, begging me to assure him that I only care for him. I cup his face with my hands. Nothing more, I love you. Only you, and I know I did something very stupid, but that was only out of anger and alcohol. It has nothing to do with me having feelings for anyone else. Why did you have him, of all people, bring you home? He was the only one who offered. Then I ask a question I instantly regret, why are you so hard on him? Hard on him, he scoffs. You're not serious. You were very cruel to humiliate him in front of me. Hardin takes a step sideways, so we're no longer standing face to face. I turn to stand in front of him, and he runs his fingers through his messy hair. He should have known better than to come here with you. You promised to keep your temper at bay. I'm trying not to push him. I want to make up, not dive deeper into this argument. I have been. Until you cheated on me, and left that party with said. I could have beat the shit out of Zed last night, and hell, I could still leave right now and do it, he says, raising his voice again. I know you could have, I'm glad you didn't. I'm not, but I'm glad you are. I don't want you to drink again. You're not the same person when you do. I can feel the tears coming, and I try to swallow them down. I know he turns away from me. I didn't mean to get that way. I was just so pissed off and hurt I was hurt. The only thing I could think to do besides kill someone was drink, so I went down to Connor's and got the whiskey. I wasn't going to drink that much, but the images of you kissing that guy just kept coming, so I kept going. I have half a mind to drive down to Connor's and yell at that old woman for selling hard in alcohol, but his 21st birthday is exactly a month from today, and the damage of last night has already been done. You were afraid of me, I saw it in your eyes, he says. No I wasn't afraid of you. I knew you wouldn't hurt me. You flinched. I remember that. Most of everything is a blur, but I remember, the clearest day. I was just caught off guard, I tell him. I knew he wasn't going to hit me, but he was behaving so aggressively, and alcohol can make people do unspeakable things that they would never do sober. He steps closer to me, almost closing the entire space between us. I don't want you to ever be caught off guard again. I won't drink like that ever again, I swear it. He brings his hand to my face and traces over my temple with his index finger. I don't want to say anything in response, this whole conversation has been confusing and very back and forth. One second I feel that he's forgiving me, but the next time I'm sure. He's speaking in a much calmer tone than I expected, but his anger is just under the surface. I don't want to be that guy, and I definitely do not want to be like my father. I shouldn't have drunk that much, but you were wrong, too. I I start to say, but he silences me and his eyes get glassy. However, I have done a list of shit an entire book of shit to you, and you always forgive me. I've done far worse than you, so I owe to you to do my best to let it go and forgive you. It isn't fair to you for me to expect things from you that I can't return. I really am sorry. Tess, for everything last night. I was a fucking idiot. I was too. I know how you feel about me with other guys, and I shouldn't have used that against you in anger. I'll try to think, before I act next time, I'm sorry. Next time? A small smile plays on Hardin's lips. He changes mood so quickly. So we are okay, then? I ask. That's not only up to me. I stare into his green eyes. I want us to be. Me too, baby. Me too. Relief washes over me as I hear his words, and I lean into his chest once more. I know that a lot of things have purposely been left unsaid, but we have resolved enough for now. He places a kiss on the top of my head and my heart flutters. Thank you. He says with some humor in his voice, hopefully the lamp will make up for it. Deciding to go with it, I smile and reply. Maybe if you could have managed to get the same lamp he looks down at me, equally amused. I clean the entire living room. He smiles. You're the one who trashed it. Still, you know how I feel about cleaning. His arms wrap tighter around me, hugging me. I wouldn't have cleaned that mess, 
I would have left it there, I tell him. Do you? Please. No way. Yes, I would. I was afraid you wouldn't be here when I got home, Hardin says. I look up at him, and he looks down at me. I'm not going anywhere, I tell him, and pray that it's true. Instead of speaking, he presses his lips to mine. Chapter 65. Tessa. What a way to begin the new year Hardin says when he pulls away from our kiss. He rests his forehead against mine. My phone buzzes on the table, breaking the spell, and before I can grab it, Hardin already has it, and is pressing it to his ear. When I get to my feet to try to take it from him, he steps back, shaking his head. Landon, Tess will have to call you back he says into the small speaker. His free hand grips my wrist, and he pulls me close to him, my back to his chest. Seconds pass before he says, she's otherwise occupied. He pulls me with him as he walks into our bedroom. His lips brush my neck, and I shudder. Oh. Stop being annoying, you two need medication, Hardin says and ends the call, before setting the phone on the desk. I have to talk to him about our classes, I say. My voice betrays me when he licks and sucks at the skin on my neck. Do you need to relax, baby? I can't, there's so much to do. I can help you. His voice is slow, slower than usual. His grip on my hip tightens when he places his other hand across my chest to hold me still. Remember that time when I fingered you in front of the mirror and made you watch yourself come, he asks. Yes. I gulp. That was fun, wasn't it, he purrs. Heat makes its way through my body at the sound of his words. Not heat, fire. I can show you how to touch yourself the way that I touch you. He sucks harshly at my skin. I have now turned into a ball of electricity. Do you want me to? The dirty idea sounds somewhat appealing, but way too humiliating to admit. I'll take your silence as a yes, he says and lets go of my waist, but takes my hand. I stay silent nervously going over his words in my mind. This is beyond embarrassing, and I'm not sure how I feel about it. He guides me to the bed and gently pushes me back onto the soft mattress. He climbs on top of me and straddles my legs. I assist Hardin in taking off my sweats, and he places a kiss on the inside of my thigh before sliding my panties off. Stay still, Tess, he instructs. I can't, I kneel as he softly bites my inner thigh. There's just no way. He chuckles, and if my brain were actually connected to the rest of my body right now, I would roll my eyes at him. Do you want to do this here, or would you like to watch, he asks and my stomach flutters. The pressure continues to build between my legs, and I attempt to squeeze them together to get some relief. No, no, baby. Not yet. He's torturing me. He pushes my thighs apart and puts more of his weight on me to keep them separated. Here, I finally answer, almost having forgotten he asked a question. Thought so. He smirks. He's so cocky, but his words do things to me that I never thought possible. I can't get enough of him, even when he has me pinned to the bed with my legs spread open. I had thought about doing this before, but I was too selfish. I wanted to be the only one to make you feel this way. He leans down and swipes his tongue along the bare skin between my hip bone and the top of my thigh. My legs involuntarily try to stiffen, but he doesn't allow it. Now, since I know exactly how you like to be touched, this will not take long. Why do you want to? I squeak when he bites down on my skin again, then licks the sensitive skin. What? He looks up at me. Why my voice is thick and shaky. Why show me, if you want to be the only one? Because despite that, the thought of you doing it to yourself, in front of me just, fuck, he breathes. Oh. I need relief and soon. I hope he doesn't plan to torture me long. Besides, you can be a little uptight sometimes, and maybe this is just what you need. He smiles, and I try to hide my face in embarrassment. If we weren't doing this, I would say something back about him calling me uptight. But he's right, and like he said earlier, I'm otherwise occupied. Here this is where you start. He surprises me by placing his cool fingers against me. A hiss escapes my lips from his cold touch. Cold, he asks and I nod. Sorry. He chuckles, then slides his fingers inside of me without warning. My hips buck off the bed, 
and I clamp my hand over my mouth to silence myself. He smirks. I just need to get them nice and warm. As he moves his fingers slowly in and out a few times, the fire within me heats up. Then he removes them, making me feel empty and desperate. Suddenly he places them back where they previously were, and I bite down on my lip. Now, don't go and do that, or we won't be able to finish your lesson. I don't look at him. Instead, I swipe my tongue across my lip and bite down again. You're very testy today. Not a very good student he teases. Even while teasing he drives me crazy, how is it possible to be so seductive without even trying? This skill is surely something that only Hardin has mastered. Give me your hand, Tess he instructs. But I don't move. Embarrassment pulls in my cheeks. Then his hand grips mine, and he brings our hands down my stomach and to the top of my thighs. If you don't want to do it, you don't have to, but I think you'll like it, Hardin says softly. I do, I decide. He smiles knowingly. You sure? Yeah, I'm just nervous, I admit. I feel much more comfortable with Hardin than with anyone I've known in my entire life, and I know he won't do anything to make me uncomfortable, not in a malicious way at least. I am just overthinking this, people do it all the time. Right? Don't be. You'll like it. He bites down on the corner of his mouth, and I smile nervously. And don't worry, if you can't get yourself off, I'll do it for you. It's no foreskin off my back. Harden. I groan in embarrassment and plop my head back down on the pillow. I hear him laugh lightly and say, like this. He spreads my fingers. My heartbeat increases dramatically as he brings my hand there. It feels so strange. Foreign and just strange. I'm so used to the way Hardin's hands feel on me, the way his fingers are rough and calloused, the way they are long and slender, the way they know exactly how to touch me, how to just do this. Hardin's voice is thick with lust as he guides my fingers to the most sensitive spot. I'm trying not to think about what we're doing what I'm doing. How does it feel? Hardin asks. I don't know, I mutter. Yes, you do. Tell me, Tess. He half demands and removes his hand from mine. I whimper at the loss of contact and begin to remove my hand. No, keep it there, baby. His tone makes my hand snap back to the spot. Continue, he commands lightly. I gulp and close my eyes, trying to repeat what Hardin was doing. It doesn't feel nearly as good as when he does it, but it most certainly doesn't feel bad either. The pressure in my lower stomach begins to build again and I screw my eyes shut, trying to pretend that it's Hardin's fingers that are making me feel this way. You look so hot touching yourself in front of me, Hardin says and I can't help, but moan and continue to trace the pattern that he's shown my fingers. When I open my eyes slightly, I see Hardin's hand rubbing over his jeans. Oh my god. Why is this so hot? This is something I thought people only did in naughty films, not real life. Hardin makes everything so hot, no matter how strange it is. His eyes are focused between my legs, and his teeth are digging into his bottom lip, making his silver ring stand up taut. The second I feel he may catch me looking at him, I snap my eyes shut, I shut off my subconscious. This is a normal and natural thing, everyone does it just not everyone has someone watching them, but if they had Hardin, they surely would. Such a good girl for me. Always, he says into my ear, nipping at my earlobe. His breath is hot, and smells of mint, and it makes me want to scream, and melt into the sheets at the same time. Do it too, I breathe, barely recognizing my voice. What? Do what I'm doing I say, not wanting to use the word. You want that? He sounds surprised. Yes please, Hardin. I'm getting so close, and I need this, I need to take some of the focus off of me. And honestly, seeing him rubbing himself just now did wicked things to me, and I want to see him do it again, that and more. Okay, he answers simply. Hardin is so confident when it comes to sex. I wish I was the same way. I hear the zipper of his jeans, and I try to slow down the movements of my fingers. If I don't, this will be over very very soon. Open your eyes, Tess, he demands, and I oblige. His hand wraps around his bare length, and my eyes go wide at the perfect side as I watch Hardin do something I never thought I would see anyone do. He leans his head down again. 
This time he plants a single kiss on my neck before bringing his mouth back to my ear. Do you like this, don't you? Do you like to watch me pleasure myself? You are so dirty, Tess, so fucking dirty. My eyes never leave his hand between his legs. His hand moves faster as he continues talking to me. I'm not going to last long watching you, baby. Do you have no idea how fucking hot this is? He groans and I do the same. I no longer feel uncomfortable. I am close, so close, and I want Harden to be close too. It feels so good, Harden I moan, not caring how stupid or desperate I sound. It's the truth, and he makes me feel like it's okay to feel this way. Fuck. Say something else, he grits out. I want you to come, Harden, just picture my mouth around you, the filthy words tumble from my lips, and I feel the warmth on my stomach as he releases onto my flaming skin. That does it for me, and I come undone from my own doing and close my eyes as I repeat his name over and over. When I open my eyes, Harden is leaning up on his elbow next to me, and I instantly bury my face in his neck. How was it? He asks, wrapping his arms around my waist to pull me close to him. I don't know I lie. Don't be shy, I know you liked it. So did I. He kisses the top of my head, and I look up at him. I did, but I still like it better when you do it I admit, and he smiles. Well, I would hope so, he says, and I lift my head up to plant a kiss over the indent of his dimple. There are a lot of things I can show you, he adds, and when I flush again he reassures me, one step at a time. My imagination runs wild at the thoughts of all the things Harding could show me, there are probably so many things I've never even heard of, that he has done, and I want to learn them all. He breaks the silence. Let's get you a shower, my star pupil. I lower my eyes at him. Do you mean your only pupil? Yeah, of course. Although maybe I should teach Landon next. He needs it just as bad as you, he teases and moves to climb off the bed. Pardon? I shriek, and he laughs, a real laugh, and it is such a beautiful sound. When my alarm goes off early Monday morning, I fly out of bed and head to the bathroom to take a shower. The water gives me energy, and my thoughts begin to travel back to my first semester at WCU. I had no idea what to expect, but at the same time I felt very prepared. I had every detail down. I thought I'd make a few friends and focus on extracurriculars, maybe join the literary club and a few more. I would spend my time in my dorm, or at the library studying and preparing for my future. Little did I know that just a few months later I would be living in an apartment with my boyfriend, who was not Noah. I had no idea what was coming when my mother pulled into the parking lot at WCU, even less so when I met the rude boy with the curly hair. I wouldn't have believed it if someone told me, and now I can't imagine my life without that crabby guy. Butterflies begin to dance in my stomach as I remember the way it felt to catch a glimpse of him on campus, to try to glance around the room, to look for him in literature, the way I'd catch him looking at me while the professor was speaking, the way he'd eavesdrop on Landon and me. Those days seem so long ago, ancient really. I'm startled from my nostalgic thoughts as the shower curtain is pulled back to reveal a shirtless Harden, his hair messy and falling over his forehead as he rubs his eyes. He smiles, his speech drawn out and thick from sleep. What are you doing in here so long? Practicing your lessons from yesterday? No. I squeak, flushing as the image of Harden coming pops into my mind. He winks. Sure, babe. I wasn't. I was just thinking, I admit. About what? He sits down on the toilet, and I close the curtain. Just about before. Before what, he asks, his tone full of worry. The first day of college, and how you were so rude, I tease. Rude? I didn't even speak to you. I laugh. Exactly. You were so annoying with your dreadful skirt and your loafer-wearing boyfriend. He claps with glee. Your mum's face was priceless when she saw us. My chest tenses at the mention of my mother. I miss her, but I refuse to take the blame for her mistakes. When she's ready to stop judging Harden and me, then I'll talk to her, but if she doesn't do that, then she doesn't deserve my time. You were annoying with your well your attitude. I can't think of what to say, because he didn't speak to me the first time I met him. Remember the second time I saw you? You were in a towel, 
and you were carrying those wet clothes. Yes, and you said you wouldn't look at me, I recall. I lied. I was certainly looking at you. It seems so long ago, doesn't it? Yes, very long ago. It doesn't seem like those things actually happened. Now it seems like it's always been us, you know what I mean? I pop my head around the curtain and smile. I do, actually. It's true, but so odd to think about Noah being my boyfriend instead of Harden. It doesn't sit right. I care for Noah so much, but both of us wasted years of our lives dating each other. I turn off the shower and push him to the back of my mind. Can you I begin to ask, but before I finish, Hardin tosses a towel over the top of the curtain. Thanks, I say while wrapping the cloth around my wet body. Hardin follows me into our bedroom, and I get dressed as fast as possible while he lies on his stomach on our bed, his eyes never leaving me. I towel dry my hair and get dressed. Hardin does a good job at distracting me with not-so-subtle gropes during the process. I'm driving you, he says and climbs off the bed to get himself dressed. We already had that established, remember? I remind him. Shut up, Tess. He shakes his head playfully, and I smile a mock innocent smile, before heading back into the living room. I decide to wear my hair straight for once. After I apply light makeup, I grab my bag and take another look inside to make sure everything I need is inside before meeting Hardin by the front door. Hardin carries my gym bag for yoga class, and I carry my bag full of everything else that I could possibly need. Go ahead, he says as we step out. What? I turn to look at him. Go ahead and spaz, he says with a sigh. I smile at him and tell him the intricate plans for the day for the tenth time in twenty-four hours. As he pretends to listen carefully, I promise him and myself that I'll be much more relaxed tomorrow. Chapter 66. Tessa. Hardin Parks is close to the coffee house as he can manage, but the campus is crowded since everyone has returned from Christmas break. He curses the entire time he circles each parking lot, and I try not to laugh at his annoyance. It's quite adorable. Give me your bag, Hardin says when I get out of the car. I hand it to him with a smile and thank him for the thoughtful gesture. It's pretty heavy, manageable but heavy. It feels strange being back on campus. So much has changed and happened since I was last here. The cold wind whips against my skin and Hardin pulls a beanie over his head before zipping his jacket up all the way. We rush through the parking lot and down the street. I should have brought a thicker jacket and gloves, and even a hat for myself. Hardin was right when he said I shouldn't wear the dress, but there is no way I am admitting that. Hardin looks adorable with his hair, hidden under the beanie, and his cheeks and nose are red from the cold. Only Hardin would look even more attractive in this harsh weather. There he is. He points to Landon as we walk inside the coffee shop. The familiarity of this small space calms my nerves, and I smile as soon as I see my closest friend sitting at a small table waiting for me. Landon smiles when he spots us, and when we get near he greets us. Good morning. Morning, I chirp back. I'll get in line, Hardin mumbles and heads to the counter. I didn't expect him to stay or get my coffee, but I'm glad he does. We don't have any classes together this semester, and I'll miss seeing him since I've gotten used to seeing him all day. Ready for the new semester? Landon asks when I take a seat across from him. The chair squeaks against the tile floor, drawing attention to us, and I smile apologetically, before taking a good look at Landon. He's tried a new hairstyle, pushing his hair up off his forehead, and it looks really good on him. As I look around the coffee shop, I begin to realize I probably should have just worn jeans and a sweatshirt. I'm the only person in the place who's remotely dressed up save for Landon in his light blue button-down shirt and khakis. Yes, and no, I tell him, and he agrees. Same. How are things? He leans across the table to whisper, you know, between you two. I look over and see Hardin has his back to us, but the barista's face is in a deep scowl. She rolls her eyes as he hands her his debit card, and I wonder what he could have done to her to irritate her so much this early in the day. Good, actually. How are things with Dakota? It feels much longer than a week since we've seen each other. Good, she's preparing for New York. That is so amazing, 
I'd love to go to New York. I can't imagine what the city is like. Me too. He smiles, and I want to tell him not to go, but I know that I can't. I haven't made my mind up yet he says, answering my thoughts. I want to go and be close to her we've lived so far for so long. But I love WCU and don't know if I want to be away from my mom and Ken to go to a huge city where I know absolutely no one, except her, of course. I nod and try to be encouraging despite myself. You would do amazing there you could go to Nayu, and the two of you could get an apartment I say. Yeah, I just don't know yet. Know what? Hardin interrupts, setting my coffee in front of me but not sitting down. Never mind. I've got to go. My first class begins in five minutes on the opposite side of campus, he says, and I cringe at the thought of running late on the first day of new classes. Okay, I'll see you after yoga. It's my last class, I tell him, and he surprises me by leaning down and planting a kiss on my lips, then my forehead. I love you, be careful being bendy, he says, and I get the feeling that if his cheeks weren't red from the cold, they would be now. His eyes shift to the floor when he remembers Landon is sitting across from us. Public displays of affection are definitely not his thing. I will. I love you, I tell him, and he gives Landon an uncomfortable head nod before walking toward the door. That was weird. Landon lifts his eyebrows and takes a drink of his coffee. Yeah, it was. I laugh and rest my chin on my hand and sigh happily. We should get going to religion, Landon says and I grab my bag from the floor and follow him outside. Luckily we don't have a long walk to our first class. I'm excited about world religion. It should be very interesting and thought-provoking, and having Landon there is an added bonus. When we enter the room, we aren't the first students to arrive, but the front row is completely empty. Landon and I sit down in the front center and take our books out. It feels good to be back in my element, Academics has always been my thing, and I love that Landon feels the same. We wait patiently as the room fills with students, most of whom are obnoxiously loud. The compactness of the classroom doesn't help with the noise either. At last, a tall man who looks too young to be a professor strides in and immediately launches into his lesson. Good morning, everyone. As most of you know by now, my name is Professor Soto. This is World Religion. You may get bored a few times, and I can promise you that you'll learn a heap of facts that you'll never actually use in the real world, but hey, what is college for? He smiles and everyone laughs. Well, this is different. So let's get started. There is no syllabus for this course. We will not be following a strict outline that isn't my style, but you'll learn all that you need to know by the end date. 75% of your grade will come from a journal that you'll be required to keep. And I know you're thinking, what does a journal have to do with religion? It doesn't per se, but in a way it does. In order to study and really understand any form of spirituality, you have to be open to the idea of anything and everything. Keeping a journal will help with that, and some of the things I'll have you write about will involve topics that people aren't comfortable with, topics that are very controversial and uncomfortable for some. But all the same, I have high hopes, that everyone will leave this class with an open mind and maybe a little knowledge. He beams and unbuttons his jacket. Landon and I both turn to look at each other at the same time. No syllabus? Landon mouths. A journal? I reply silently. Professor Soto takes a seat at the large desk in the front of the room and pulls a bottle of water from his bag. You can talk amongst yourselves until the end of class, or you can go ahead and go for today and we'll begin the real work tomorrow. Just sign the roster, so I can see how many flakes we had that didn't show for the first day," he announces with a playful grin. The class howls and cheers before departing quickly, Landon shrugs at me, and we both stand up after the room is empty. We're the last to sign the attendance roster. Well, I guess this is cool. I can call Dakota for a little while between classes, he says and packs his things. The rest of the day goes by quickly, and I'm eager to see Hardin. I've sent him a few text messages, but he has yet to respond. My feet are killing me as I make my way to the athletic building. I hadn't realized how far of a walk it would be. 
The smell of sweat invades my nostrils as soon as I open the main door and I hurry to the locker room labeled with a stick figure and address. The walls are lined with thin red lockers, the metal showing through the chipped paint job. How do we know which locker to use? I ask a short brunette wearing a bathing suit. Just pick one and use the lock you brought, she says. Oh of course, I didn't think to bring a lock. Seeing my expression, she digs into her bag and hands me a small lock. Here, I have an extra. The combination is on the back, I haven't removed the sticker. I thank her as she walks out of the room. After I'm changed into a new pair of black yoga pants and a white t-shirt, I head out. As I walk down the hall to the yoga room, a group of lacrosse players pass by, several of them making a vulgar remark that I choose to ignore. All of them except one keeps moving. You trying out for cheer next year? The boy asks, his deep brown, almost black eyes looking me up and down. Me? No, I'm just on my way to yoga class, I stammer. We are the only people in this hall. Oh, that's too bad. You would look phenomenal in a skirt. I have a boyfriend, I announce and try to move around him. He blocks me. I have a girlfriend what does that matter? He smiles and takes a step, cornering me. He doesn't appear intimidating at all, but something about his cocky smile makes my skin crawl. I need to get to class, I say. I can walk you or you can skip, and I could show you around. He puts his arm up on the wall next to my head, and I step backward with nowhere to go. Get the fuck away from her. Hardin's voice booms from behind me, and the creep turns his head to look at him. He looks more intimidating than ever in long basketball shorts and a black t-shirt with the sleeves cut off to reveal his tattooed arms. I'm sorry, man, I didn't know she had a boyfriend, he lies. Did you not hear me? I said get the fuck away from her. Hardin walks toward us, and the lacrosse player backs away quickly, but Hardin grabs hold of his shirt and slams him against the wall. I don't stop him. Come near her again, and I'll crack your skull against this wall. Do you understand me? He growls. D.S. The guy stutters and rushes down the hall. Thank God, I say and wrap my arm around his neck. Why are you here? I thought you didn't need any more PE classes? I ask. I decided to take one. And good thing. He sighs and takes my hand into his. Which one? I ask. I can't imagine Hardin being athletic at all. Yours. I gasp. You didn't. Oh, yes I did. His anger seems to be dissolved as he smiles at my horrified expression. Chapter 67. Tessa. Hardin makes it a point to walk slightly behind me and I suddenly want to go back to the 10th grade when I would tie a sweater around my waist to hide myself. His voice is quiet as he says, you're going to need to get more of these pants. I remember the last time I wore yoga pants in front of Hardin and the crude remarks he made and those yoga pants weren't as tight as these. I laugh lightly and grab his hand to force him to walk next to me instead of behind me. You weren't seriously taking yoga. No matter how hard I try to picture hard in posing, the image just won't come. Yeah, I am. You do know what yoga is, don't you? I ask him as we walk into the room. Yes, Tessa. I know what it is, and I'm taking it with you, he huffs. Why? It doesn't matter why, I just want to spend more time with you. Oh. I'm not convinced by his explanation, but I'm looking forward to seeing him try to do yoga, and the extra time with him doesn't hurt either. In the center of the room, the instructor sits on a bright yellow mat. Her curly brown hair piled on top of her head, and her flower print shirt make a welcoming first impression. Where is everyone? Hardin asks me as I grab a purple mat from the shelving unit on the wall. Wearily. I hand him a blue one, and he examines it, before tucking it under his arm. Of course we are. He smiles sarcastically, and follows me to the front of the room. I begin to lay my mat down directly in front of the instructor, but Hardin grabs my arm to stop me. No way, we're sitting in the back, he says, and I see the instructor's face alight with a slight smile at his words. What? Sitting in the back of the class for yoga? No, I always sit in the front. Exactly. We're sitting in the back, he repeats and takes my mat from my hands to head to the back of the room. If you are going to be grumpy, 
You shouldn't stay, I whisper. To him. I'm not grumpy. The instructor waves and introduces herself to us as Marla when we take a seat on our mats and afterward Hardin claims with certainty that she's high, which makes me giggle. This is going to be a fun class. However, as the room fills with girls in tight yoga pants and tiny tank tops who all seem to glance or stare at Hardin, I get steadily less sin. Of course he's the only male. Luckily, he doesn't seem to notice the heaps of female attention he's receiving. Either that, or he's just very used to it, that has to be it. He gets attention like this all of the time. It's not like I blame the girls, but he's my boyfriend, and they need to look elsewhere. I know some of the girls are looking at him because of his tattoos and piercings. They must be wondering why the heck he's taking a yoga class. Okay, everyone. Let's get started, the instructor calls through the room. She introduces herself as Marla to everyone else and gives a short speech about why and how she got into teaching yoga. She's never going to shut up, is she? Hardin groans after a few minutes. Eager to pose, are you? I raise my brow. Pose what, he asks. First we'll begin with a few stretches, Marla says just then. Hardin sits still on the floor, while everyone else mimics her actions. I can feel his eyes on me the entire time. You are supposed to be stretching, I scold him, and he shrugs but doesn't move. Then, in a sing-song voice, Marla calls Hardin out. You in the back, join us. Erm sure, he mumbles and then crosses his long legs and stretches them in front and attempts to reach his toes. I force myself to look toward the front of the room and away from Hardin to prevent the laughter that is fighting to surface. You're supposed to touch your toes, the blonde girl next to Hardin says. Trying, he says with an overly saccharine smile. Why did he even respond to her, and why am I so jealous? She giggles at him, while the image of me slamming her head against the wall plays on repeat in my mind. I always lecture Hardin about his temper, but here I am planning this whore's murder and calling her a whore, even though I don't know her. I can't really see clearly, I'm going to move up, I tell Hardin. He looks surprised as he speaks. Why? I wasn't, it's nothing, I just want to be able to see and hear what's going on, I explain and drag my mat a few feet, stopping directly in front of Hardin. I sit down and finish stretching with the group. I don't have to turn around to see the look on Hardin's face. Tess, he hisses, trying to get my attention, but I don't turn around. Tessa. Let's begin with a downward dog pose, it's very simple, and a basic one, Marla says. I bend down, place my palms against the mat, and look at Hardin through the space between my stomach and the floor. He's standing still with his mouth open. Once more Marla notices Hardin's lack of movement. Hey, man, you thinking of joining us in yoga, she asks jokingly. If she does it again, I won't be surprised if he curses her out in front of the entire class. I close my eyes and shift my hips, so I'm bending over completely. Tessa, I hear him say again. The Riyasa. What, Hardin? I'm trying to concentrate, I say, looking at him again. He's now leaning over, attempting to do the pose, but his long body is bent at an awkward angle, and I can't help but burst into laughter. Shut up, would you, he snaps, and I laugh louder. You are terrible at this, I tease. You are distracting me, he says through his teeth. I am? How? I love having the upper hand with Hardin, because it doesn't happen often. You know how, Minx, he whispers. I know the girl next to him can hear us, but I don't care, I hope she does. Move your mat, then. I purposely stand up to stretch, and bend back down into the pose. Do you move you're the one toying with me. Teasing, I correct him, using his words from minutes ago against him. Okay. Let's move into a halfway lift, Marla says. I stand again then bend at my waist, putting my hands flat on my knees and making sure my back is at a 90 degree angle. You've got to be kidding me. Hardin groans at the side of my bottom practically right in front of his face. I turn around to look at him and see that he isn't remotely doing the pose correctly. He has his hands on his knees, but his back is almost straight. Okay. Now for the forward fold. Our instructor calls, and I bend down, 
folding my body. It's really like she wants me to fuck you right in front of everyone, he says, and I snap my head up to make sure no one heard him. SHHH I plead and hear him chuckle. Move your mat, or I'll say everything that I'm thinking right now, he threatens, and I quickly stand up and move my mat back to its previous spot next to him. Thought so. He smirks. You can tell me those things later, I whisper, and he tilts his head to the side. Trust me, I will, Harding promises and my stomach flutters. He doesn't participate in much of the remainder of class, and the blonde ends up changing her spot halfway through, probably because Hardin won't stop talking. We're supposed to be meditating, I whisper back to him, and close my eyes. The room is silent, except for Hardin's quiet whispers. This is so fucking lame, he complains. You're the one who signed up for yoga. I didn't know how lame it was. I'm literally about to fall asleep right here. Stop whining. I can't. You had to go and get me all worked up, and now I'm stuck sitting cross-legged, meditating, with a heart on in a room full of people. Harden. I hiss, louder than intended. SHHH multiple voices attempt to silence me. Harden laughs, and I stick my tongue out at him, earning a dirty look from the girl to my right. Harden and me taking yoga together is not going to work. I'm going to get kicked out or fail. We're dropping this class, he says when the meditation is over. You are, I'm not. I need a PE credit, I inform him. Great first day, everyone. I look forward to seeing you later this week. Nemist, Marla says, dismissing us. I roll my mat up, but Hardin doesn't bother. He just shoves his onto the shelf. Chapter 68. Tessa. The girl who gave me her extra lock is nowhere to be found when I return to the locker room, so I just put the lock back on the handle, and if she doesn't claim it back tomorrow, then I'll continue to use it and pay her or something. When I finish collecting my things, I meet Hardin back in the hall. He's leaning against the wall with one foot perched on the wall behind him. If you'd taken any longer, I'd have barged in there, he threatens. You should have. You wouldn't have been the only guy in there, I lie and watch as his features change. I turn away from him, taking a few steps, before he grabs my arm and spins me back around to face him. What did you just say, he demands eyes half-closed and primal. Teasing. I smirk, and with a huff he lets go of my arm. I think you've done enough of that today. Maybe. I smile. He shakes his head. You clearly enjoy tormenting me. The yoga relaxed me, and cleansed my aura. I laugh. Not mine, he reminds me as we walk outside. The first day of the new semester went very well, even yoga, which ended up being amusing. Amusing is not my usual preference when it comes to academics, but having heart in there was nice. My religion class may be a problem because of the lack of structure, but I'm just going to try to go with the flow so I don't drive myself insane. I have some work to do for a few hours, but I'll be finished by dinner time, Hardin tells me. He's been working a lot lately. That hockey game is tomorrow, right? He asks. Yes, you're still going aren't you? I don't know I need to know, because if you flake then I'm going to go with him, I respond. Landon would probably much rather I go with him, but the two of them could use some bonding time together. I know they'll never be friends really, but it would help tremendously if they got along better. Fine, fuck. I'll go he sighs and climbs into the car. Thank you. I smile and he rolls his eyes. A half hour later, we pull into his usual spot in the parking lot of our apartment. How are your classes? I ask him. Hey them all except yoga? I try to lighten up the mood. Yes, except yoga. Yoga was certainly interesting. He turns to look at me. Really? How so? I chew on my bottom lip in an attempt to appear innocent. I think it has something to do with a blonde. He smirks and I tense. Excuse me? You didn't see the hot blonde next to me? You're really missing out, babe. You should see the way her ass looks in those yoga pants. I scowl and open the car door. Where are you going? He asks. Inside. It's cold in this car. Aw oh, Tess, are you jealous of the girl in yoga? Hardin teases. No. Yes, you are, he challenges me, and I roll my eyes, while I climb out of the car. 
I'm a little surprised when I hear his boots clomping on the concrete behind me. Pulling the heavy glass door open, I go inside and am at the elevator before I remember that I forgot my bag in the car. You're an idiot. He chuckles. Excuse me. I look up at him. Do you think I'd be looking at some random blonde when you're there when I can look at you? Especially in these pants, I am not looking and literally cannot look at anyone else. I was referring to you. He takes a long stride toward me and I step back against the cold lobby wall. I practically pout. Well, I saw her trying to flirt with you. I don't like the way jealousy feels. It is the most obnoxious emotion possible. You silly girl. He takes one more step to bring his body to mine and then leads us into the elevator. Cupping my cheek, he forces me to make eye contact. How can you not comprehend what you do to me, he asks, inches away from my mouth. I don't know, I squeak when his free hand grabs mine and leads it down to his shorts. This is what you do. He shifts his hips, so his erection fills my hand. Oh. My head is swimming. You'll be saying much more than oh, he begins, but is interrupted when the elevator stops at the next floor. You've got to be kidding me, he groans when a woman and her three children step into the elevator. I try to step away from him, but he wraps his arm around my waist, refusing to let me move. One of the children begins to cry, which makes Hardin huff an annoyance. I begin to imagine how humorous it would be if the elevator stalled and we were trapped inside with a crying child. Fortunately for Hardin, the doors open moments later and we step out into the hall. I literally despise children, he complains as we reach our apartment. When he unlocks the door, cold air flows out from the apartment. Did you turn the heat off? I ask him when we walk inside. No, it was on this morning. Hardin walks over to the thermostat and curses under his breath. It says it's 80 degrees in here when it's clearly not. I'll call maintenance. I nod and grab the blanket from the back of the couch and wrap it around myself before sitting down. Yes it isn't working, and it's cold as fuck in here. Hardin speaks into the receiver. 30 minutes? No, that won't work I don't give a shit, I pay a small fortune to live here, and I won't have my girlfriend freezing to death he says, then corrects himself. I won't have it freezing in here. He glances over at me, and I look away. Fine. 15 minutes. No longer he barks into the phone and tosses it against the couch. They're sending someone up to fix it he tells me. Thank you. I smile at him, and he sits down next to me on the couch. I open the front of the blanket and reach for him. When he scoots closer, I climb onto his lap and thread my fingers through his hair and tug lightly. What are you doing? His hands rest on my hips. You said we have 15 minutes. I brush my lips along his jaw and he shivers. I feel his jaw move into a smile. Are you coming on to me, Tess? Hard and I whine to prevent him from teasing me further. I'm joking, now take your clothes off, he demands, but his hands lift the bottom of my shirt, contradicting his own command. Chapter 69. Hardin. Goosebumps rise on her skin as my fingertips slide down her arms. I know she's cold, but I would like to think they're partly caused by me. My fingers wrap around her arms more forcefully when she shifts on my lap, pushing her hips down onto me to create the friction that I want and need. I have never wanted someone so much, so often. Yes, I have fucked plenty of girls, but that was just about the thrill, about the bragging rights, it was never about being closer to them the way it is with Tess. With her, it's about the sensation, about the way these small bumps raise on her skin from my touch, the way she'll complain that having goosebumps makes her have to shave more frequently, and I will roll my eyes at her, even though I find it humorous, the way she whimpers when I bring her lip between my teeth, and it makes that noise when it snaps back, and, most importantly, the way that we're doing something that only her and I share. No one has or will ever be close to her in this way. Her small fingers move to unclasp her bra as I suck on the skin just above the cup. I stop her. We don't have long I remind her and she pouts, making me want her even more. Then hurry and get undressed, she softly demands. I love the way she's becoming more and more comfortable with me as the days pass. You know I don't have to be told twice. 
I wrap my hands around her hips and lift her off, moving her over on the couch a bit. I remove my shorts and boxers before gesturing for her to lie down. As I grab a condom from my wallet on the table, she slides her pants off, those damn yoga pants. I have never, in my entire 20 years of life, seen anything so sexy. I don't have a fucking clue what it is about them, maybe the way they cling to her thighs, showing every heavenly curve, or maybe because. They display her ass perfectly but either way they're going to have to become what she wears around the house of all times. You have really got to get on birth control, I don't want to use these anymore I gripe, and she nods, staring at my fingers while they are all the condom on. I mean it, though. I'm going to remind her every morning. Tessa surprises me by pulling my arm in an attempt to force me to sit down on the cushion next to her. What? I ask, catching on to what she's doing, but I want to hear her say it. I love the innocence she possesses, but I know she's so much dirtier than she allows herself to admit another trait that only I am aware of. She glares at me, and time is short, so I decide not to taunt her. Instead, I sit down and immediately pull her onto me, wrapping my fingers in her hair and attaching my lips to hers. I swallow the moans and cries coming from her lips as I lower her onto me. We both sigh and her eyes roll back, nearly making me come on the spot. Next time we'll be slow, baby, but this time we only have a few minutes left. Okay? I groan into her ear as she rotates her full hips. Mm hum she moans. I take that as my cue to pick up the pace. My arms wrap around her back and pull her close to me so that her chests are touching and I lift my hips at the same time she's rotating hers. The feeling is indescribable. I can barely breathe as we both move faster. We don't have long and for once I'm desperate to finish quickly. Talk to me, Tess, I beg, knowing she will be shy, but hoping that, if I slam into her hard enough, tug at the ends of her hair hard enough, she will gain the courage to speak to me in a way she has before. Okay she pants, and I move faster. Hard in her voice is shaky, and she bites her lip to calm herself, turning me on even more. The pressure begins to build in my stomach. Harden, you feel so good she gains confidence, and I curse under my breath. You are already whining, and I haven't said anything, she boasts. Her smug tone brings me to the edge and pushes me over. Her body trembles and stiffens, and I watch her climax. It's like she's just as, if not more, captivating each time she comes. This is why I cannot get enough of her and never will. A knock at the door brings us both back from our post-orgasm almost sedated state, and she jumps off me in an instant. She grabs her shirt off the floor as I remove the spent condom and pick up my clothes from the floor. Give me a minute, I call out. Tessa lights a candle and begins to rearrange the decorative pillows on our couch. What is with the candle? I ask as I dress and make my way toward the front door. It smells like sex in here, she whispers, despite the fact that the maintenance worker can't hear her. She frantically runs her fingers through her hair, my only response is a chuckle and a shake of my head just before I pull open the door. The man on the other side of the door is tall, taller than me, and has a full beard. His brown hair touches his shoulders, and he looks to be at least 50. Heats out, right? His raspy voice asks. He has clearly smoked too many cigarettes. Yes, why else would it be 20 degrees in this apartment? I reply and watches his eyes land on my Tessa. Of course she would be bending over to retrieve her cell phone charger from the basket under the table. And of course she would be wearing the fucking yoga pants while doing so. And of course this greasy man with a damn beard would be checking out her ass. And of course she would stand back up and be oblivious to the entire exchange. Hey, Tess, why don't you go in the bedroom until it's fixed, I say. It's warmer in there. No, I'm okay. I'll stay out here with you. She shrugs and sits down on the chair. My patience is wearing thin, and when she lifts her arms behind her head to tie her hair up, and she's practically giving this asshole a show, it takes everything in me not to drag her. Into the room. I must be staring angrily at her, because she looks over at me and then says, okay, clearly puzzled. She gathers her schoolbooks in her arms and stalks into the bedroom. Fix the fucking heater, I snap at the old perv. 
he gets to work silently and stays quiet, so he must be smarter than I assumed. After a few minutes, Tess's phone vibrates on the end table, and I take it upon myself to answer it when I see that the screen reads Kimberly. Hello? Harden? Kimberly's voice is so high-pitched, I have no idea how Christian can stand it. It must be her looks that drew him in. Probably in a club, when he couldn't hear her very well. Yes. Lem get Tess I open the bedroom door to find Tessa lying across the bed with a pen between her teeth, her feet kicking in the air behind her. Kimberly is on the phone, I explain, tossing the cell on the bed next to her. She snatches it up and says, hey Kim, is everything okay? A few seconds pass before she says, oh no, that's terrible. I raise my browder, but she doesn't notice. Oh okay let me speak to Harden about it. It'll only take a second, I'm sure it'll be fine. She removes the phone from her ear and covers the bottom with her hand. Christian caught some sort of stomach flu and Kim needs to take him to the hospital. It's nothing too serious, but his babysitter isn't available, she whispers. So? I shrug. They don't have anyone to watch Smith. I and you're telling me this because? She wants to know if we can. She chews on the inside of her cheek. There is no way in hell she's suggesting that she wants to babysit that child. Can what? Tessa sighs. Babysit, Harden. Nope. Absolutely not. Why not? He's a good kid, she whines. No, Tessa, this isn't a daycare. Not happening, tell Kim to buy him some Tylenol and some chicken soup and call it a day. Harden she's my friend and he's my boss, who is sick. I thought you cared for him? She asks and my stomach turns. Of course I like him, he was there for me, and my mum when my father was fucking up, but that doesn't mean I want to watch his kid, when I already have to go to a hockey game with Landon tomorrow. I said no, I say, standing my ground. The last thing I need, is some annoying kid with a Kool-Aid mustache messing up my apartment. Please, Harden, she begs. They don't have anyone else. Please. I know she's going to say yes regardless, she's just entertaining me. I sign defeat and watch his smile grow on her face. Chapter 70. Harden. Would you stop griping? You're behaving worse than he will, and he's five, Tessa scolds me, and I roll my eyes. I'm just saying, this is all you. He better not touch any of my shit. Do you agree to this, so he's your problem, not mine? I remind her right as a knock at the door heralds their arrival. Taking a seat on the couch, I let Tessa be the one to open the door. She glares at me, but doesn't make the guests, her guests, wait long before plastering on her biggest and brightest smile and throwing the door to her place open wide. Immediately Kimberly starts rambling, practically shrieking. Thank you so much. You have no idea how much of a lifesaver the two of you are right now. I have no idea what we would have done if you couldn't watch Smith. Christian is so sick, he's throwing up everywhere, and we, it's okay, really, Tess interrupts her, I assume because she doesn't want to hear the gory details of Christian's vomitousness. Okay, well, he's in the car, so I better get going. Smith is pretty independent, he mostly keeps to himself and will let you know if he needs anything. She moves to the left, revealing a small boy with dirty blonde hair. Hey Smith. How are you? Tessa says in a strange voice I've never heard her use before. This must be her attempt at baby talk, even though the kid's five. Only Tessa. The boy doesn't say anything, just gives her a small smile and walks past Kimberly into the living room. Yeah, he doesn't talk much, Kimberly tells Tess, noticing the sad look on her face. As humorous as it is that he didn't respond to Tessa, I don't want her to be upset, so the little shit better knock it off and be nice to her. Okay, I'm really leaving this time. Kim smiles and closes the door after giving Smith one last wave. Tessa bends down a bit and asks Smith, are you hungry? He shakes his head no. Thirsty? Same response, only this time he takes a seat on the couch opposite me. Do you want to play a game? Tess, I think he just wants to sit here, I tell her, and watches her cheeks flush. I flip through the channels on the television, 
hoping to find something of interest to keep me occupied while Tessa is babysitting. Sorry, Smith, she apologizes. I just want to make sure you're okay. He nods rather robotically, and I realize that he actually looks an awful lot like his father. His hair is practically the exact color. His eyes are the same shade of green-blue, and I suspect that, if you were to smile he would have the same dimples as Christian. A few minutes of awkward silence pass during which Tessa stands next to the couch, and I can see her plans unraveling. She had assumed he would come in here full of energy and ready to play with her. Instead, he hasn't spoken a single word or budged from his spot on the couch. His outfit is as immaculate as I figured it would be. His small white tennis shoes look as if they have never been worn. When I glance up from his blue polo shirt, his eyes are on mine. What? I ask. He looks away quickly. Harden. Tessa groans. What? All I did was wonder why he was staring at me. I shrug and turn the channel from the garbage I'd accidentally stopped on. The last thing I want to watch is the Kardashians. Be nice. She glares at me. I am, I say and shrug my shoulders like what's the big deal? Tessa rolls her eyes. Well, I'm going to make dinner. Smith, do you want to come with me or sit with Hardin? I feel his gaze on me, but I choose not to look. He needs to go with her. She's the babysitter here, not me. Go with her, I tell him. You can stay in here, Smith, Hardin won't bother you, she assures him. He stays silent. Surprise. Tessa disappears into the kitchen, and I turn the television up louder to avoid any possible conversation with the rug rat, not that that is likely to happen anyway. I'm half tempted to go in the kitchen with her and make him sit alone in the living room. Minutes pass and I begin to grow uncomfortable with him just sitting here. Why the hell isn't he talking or playing, or whatever the hell it is that five-year-olds do? So what's the deal? Why don't you talk? I finally ask. He shrugs. It's rude to ignore people when they're talking to you, I inform him. It's more rude to ask me why I don't talk, he fires back. He has a slight British accent, not strong like his father's, but not completely watered down either. Well, at least now I know you're able to speak, I say, kind of thrown off guard by his cheeky response and not really sure what to say to him. Why do you want me to talk so bad, he asks, seeming much older than five. I I don't know. Why don't you like to? I don't know. He shrugs. Is everything okay in there? Tessa calls from the kitchen. For a second, I consider telling her no, that the kid is dead or injured, but the humor is lost with the thought. Everything is fine. I yell back. I hope she's finished soon, because I'm finished with this conversation. Why do you have those things in your face? Smith asks pointing to my lip ring. Because I want to. Maybe the better question is, why don't you have any? I say to turn the tables on him, trying not to remember that he's a kid after all. Do they hurt? He asks, ducking my question. No, not at all. They look like it. He half smiles. He isn't so bad, I guess, but I still don't like the idea of babysitting him. Almost finished in here, Tessa calls out. Okay. I'm just teaching him how to make a homemade bomb out of a soda bottle, I tease, which causes her to poke her head around the corner to check on us. She's mental, I tell him, and he laughs, dimples showing. She's pretty, he whispers into cupped hands. Yeah, she is. Isn't she? I nod and look up at Tess with her hair pulled up into some sort of nest on top of her head, her yoga pants and a plain t-shirt still on, and I nod again. She's beautiful and she doesn't even have to try. I know she can hear us still, and I catch a glimpse of her smile as she turns to finish her task in the kitchen. I don't get why she's smiling like that, so what if I'm talking to this kid? He's still annoying, like all the other half-sized humans. Yeah, really pretty, he agrees again. Okay, calm down, little dude. She's mine, I tease. He looks at me with an O for a mouth. Dear what? Dear wife? No, fuck, no, I scoff. Fuck, no, he repeats. Shit, don't say that. I reach across the couch to cover his mouth. Don't say shit, he asks, shaking free of my hand. No, 
Don't say shit, or fuck. This is one of the many reasons I shouldn't be around kids. I know they're bad words he tells me, and I nod. So don't say them I remind him. Who is she if he isn't your wife? God, he's a nosy little shit. She's my girlfriend. I should have never got this kid talking in the first place. He folds his hands together and looks up at me like a little priest or something. Do you want her to be your wife? No, I don't want her to be my wife I say slowly but clearly so he can hear me and maybe get it this time. Ever? Never. And you have a baby? No. Hell, no. Where do you get these things? Just hearing them aloud is stressing me out. Why do he starts to ask, but I cut him off. Stop asking so many questions. I groan and he nods, before grabbing the remote out of my hand and changing the channel. Tessa hasn't checked up on us in a few minutes, so I decide to go into kitchen and see if she's almost finished. Tessa are you almost done, because he's talking way too much, I complain, grabbing a piece of broccoli from the dish she's preparing. She hates when I eat before a meal is ready, but there is a five-year-old in my living room, so I can eat this damn broccoli. Yeah. Just another minute or two, she answers without looking at me. Her tone is strange, and something seems off. Do you okay? I ask her when she turns around with glassy eyes. Yeah, I'm fine. It was just the onions. She shrugs and turns the faucet on to wash her hands. It's okay he'll talk to you too. He's warmed up now, I assure her. Yeah, I know. It's not that it's just the onions, she says again. Chapter 71. Harden. The little shit remains mute and just nods when Tessa asks him cheerfully, do you like the chicken, Smith? It's really good. I say over enthusiastically to soften the blow of the kid still not wanting to speak to her. She gives me an appreciative smile but doesn't meet my eyes. The rest of the meal is eaten in silence. While Tessa cleans up the kitchen, I head back into the living room. I can hear the small footsteps following me. Can I help you? I ask and plop down on the couch. No. He shrugs, turning his attention to the television. Okay, then there is literally nothing on tonight. Is my dad going to die? The small voice next to me suddenly asks. I look at him. What? My dad, will he be dead? Smith asks, though he looks pretty unfazed by the whole topic. No. He's just sick with food poisoning or something. My mom was sick, and now she's dead, he says, and the little quaver in his voice makes me realize he's not immune to the worry, causing me to choke on my own breath. Erm yeah. That was different. Poor kid. Why? Christ, he asks so many questions. I want to call for Tess, but something about the worried expression on his face stops me. He won't even speak to her so I don't think he would want me to bring her in here. Your dad is just a little sick, and your mum was really sick. Your dad will be fine. Are you lying? He speaks well beyond his years, sort of the way I always have. I suppose that is what happens when you're forced to grow up too quickly. No, I would tell you, if your dad was going to die, I say, and mean it. Do you would? His bright eyes are shining, and I'm terrified that he may cry. I have no fucking idea what I would do if he cried right now. Run. I would run into the other room and hide behind Tessa. Yep. Now let's talk about something a little less morbid. What's morbid? Something that's twisted and fucked up, I explain. Bad word, he scolds me. It's okay for me to say, because I'm an adult. Still a bad word. You said two of them earlier. I could tell your dad on you, I threaten. I'll tell your pretty girl on you, he counters, and I can't help but laugh. Okay, okay, you win, I say, gesturing for him to just stay put. Tess appears around the corner. Smith, do you want to come in here with me? Smith looks at her, then looks back up at me and asks, can I stay with Hardin? I don't, she begins, but I interrupt. Fine. I sigh and hand the kid the remote. Chapter 72. Tessa. I watch as Smith settles in on the couch, scooting slightly closer to Hardin. Hardin looks at him with caution, but doesn't stop him or say anything about his proximity. It's ironic that Smith seems to like Hardin when Hardin clearly despises children. 
Though Sin Smith feels in some ways more like a country gentleman from an Austin novel, he may or may not be included in that category. Never, he said to Smith, when asked about marrying me. Never. He never plans on having a future with me. I knew this somewhere deep inside, but it still hurts me to hear him say it, especially the cold and confident way he said it, like it was a joke or something. He could have softened the blow, even just a little. I don't want to be married right now, obviously, not for years. But it's the idea that it isn't even a possibility that hurts me, a lot. He says that he wants to be with me forever, yet he doesn't want to be married? Are we supposed to just be boyfriend and girlfriend forever? Am I okay with never having children? Will he love me enough to make this all okay, despite the future I had always envisioned for myself? I honestly don't know, and my head is pounding thinking about it. I don't want to obsess about the future right now, I'm only 19. We've been getting along so well, and I don't want to ruin that. After the kitchen is clean, and the dishwasher is loaded, I check on Hardin and Smith once more, before going into the bedroom, to get my things ready for tomorrow. My phone rings as I lay out a long black skirt for tomorrow. Kimberly. Hey, is everything okay? I ask after answering. Yeah, everything is okay. They're giving him some antibiotics and we should be getting sent home soon. It may be late, I hope that's okay, she says. Of course it is. Do what you need to do. How's Smith doing? He's good, he's actually hanging out with Hardin, I tell her, still not believing it myself. She laughs heartily. Really? Hardin? Yeah, tell me about it. I roll my eyes and make my way back into the living room. Well, that's unexpected, but it's good training for when you have little Hardins running around the house, she teases. Her words tug at my heart, and I bite down on my lip. Yeah, I guess so. I want to change the subject before the lump in my throat grows any larger. Well, we'll be done soon, hopefully. Smith's bedtime is 10, but since it's already 10, just let him stay up until you want him to go to sleep. Thank you again, Kimberly says and hangs up. I make a quick stop in the kitchen to pack a small lunch for tomorrow. I'll just bring leftovers from tonight. Why? I hear Smith ask Hardin. Because they're trapped on the island. Why? Their plane crashed. How come they're not Ed? It's a show. A stupid show, Smith says, and Hardin laughs. Yeah, I guess you're right. Hardin shakes his head in amusement, and Smith giggles. They look alike in some ways, the dimples, the shape of their eyes, and their smiles. I imagine that, except for the blonde hair and shade of eyes, Hardin looked much like Smith when he was younger. Is it okay, if I go to bed? Or do you want me to watch him? I ask Hardin. He looks at me, then at Smith. Um that's cool. We're just watching mindless television anyway, he says. Okay, good night Smith. I'll see you in a bit, when Kim is here to get you, I tell him. He looks over at Hardin, then back to me and smiles. Night, he whispers. I turn to go back into the room, but I'm stopped by Hardin's fingers wrapping around my arm. Hey. No good night to me? He pouts. Oh yeah. Sorry. I hug him, and give him a kiss on the cheek. Good night, I say, and he hugs me again. You sure you're okay? He asks, pushing my shoulders back, so he can look at me. Yeah, I'm just really tired, and he wants to hang out with you, anyway. I smile weakly. I love you, he tells me, and kisses my forehead. I love you, I respond and hurry to the bedroom and close the door behind me.